Hey, Mario. What? Oh, shit. Andy's here as well. Didn't expect Andy Joe. to be so early. Joe, nice to see you again. I really enjoyed your Bitcoin analysis last time. Hey, Ryan. Appreciate that. Good to see you as well. All right, well, we're going to wait for KK to join. And uh, he's got the whole agenda. So if he, if he has any technical issues, we're pretty screwed. But I appreciate you all being here. So we've got a pretty, pretty full agenda today. We're going to kick it off with... Um, so we've got a lot of panelists. We've got some, some controversial panelists as well. A lot of great discussions, a lot of great debates. Uh, we're going to be talking about... Um, you know, I brought some people from the Bitcoin space that have been around for, for many years, you know, much before NFTs uh, were even a thing. Uh, just to, to get their perspective on the NFT market today, to get their thoughts on the market, and to kind of get different perspectives, because you know, a lot of the spaces mainly have all the NFT leaders right now. Um, so I wanted some of the Bitcoin OGs. You know, I've been back, I've been in the space since 2017. Ryan, when did you get into the space? Crypto. I bought I bought a Bitcoin on Mount Gox, and then oh, I shit. lost it. <laughs> yep, so that was fun. And Wait, then I logged into Coin. I actually like I bought some on Coinbase really early too, and I forgot about it. And I logged in, and I was like, "Holy shit, yay!" So that was my Bitcoin experience. Do you remember in, in 2017? Like most of the people that we talk about in crypto today were, you know, a lot of the people back in 2017, Bitcoin Jesus, Jimmy Song. Uh, Jimmy, I think Jimmy Song. Um, no one talks about them anymore, and now you've got that new generation, the NFT and metaverse generation. Have you sensed that shift, or is just me? I'm just I'm just following the wrong people on on Twitter. No, I think, I, I think it's true. But but uh, what was the real thing? I think I think that uh, they're totally separate communities. Like there's barely any crossover at all. They actually chart this. So there's like a bubble chart of how the crypto communities are like. D dispersed and uh, the NFT guys kind of live in their own bubble. So, like all the blue, all the NFT guys have blue check marks, and like none of the, like very few of the Bitcoin guys do. Yeah, and, and then all the NFT guys have the the NFT profile picture, and you can verify it on Twitter. And then all the Bitcoin guys usually have the the laser eyes, or they just don't have anything anymore. So it's uh, yeah, and they don't like each other either. So. Uh, I like, I like the guys that used to have .eth in their name, and then they, like, pulled that shit. They're like, oh, down 85%. Pull that I fucking to, .eth. I used to have vryancarson.eth, but then I realized, well, wait a minute. Like, I believe in more than ETH, um, but I, I still I still hold mostly ETH. But I, I want to just say up on stage, like, we got to do less of this tribalism. Um, no. Shtick, you know, like, hey, we're, no. we're, all, we're all in this together. Like, nope. You're wrong. Okay. Bullshit. <laughs> wrong. <laughs> I, so I like, like this is like this type of opinion. this is the this kumbaya bullshit is why everyone just got wrecked. So I'm the guy that's saying you got to have keys in your own position, not your key, not your keys, not your coins. Oh, I've no, been saying it for that. years, no, no, and no, then no. everyone else promoted it. Everybody promoted Luna. Everybody promoted Celsius. Every promoted everybody promoted BlockFi. Everyone treated me like shit. I was right. They were wrong. They're fucking bankrupt. They're wrecked because they didn't listen to me. They listen to everyone the fuck else. Everyone else was wrong. I was right. And so this, like, pretend we're all on the same team shit, we are not all on the same team. There's real cryptocurrency, there's no counterparty risk, and then there's scams. I've also been watching Evolution, Richard, as well since the, the 2017, 2016 days till today. I know there's a lot of people that, that you know, you've got a lot of controversy around Hex, which you're going to touch on, and, and your take on the market is very... Uh, um, very interesting. So we're going to yeah, dig I, into that later on. Oh yeah, no, Richard. Clearly, like I, you gotta, you have to have a custodial wall. I'm talking about ETH versus Bitcoin. Like these are both, you know. No, Bitcoin soft. sucks. Bitcoin's trash. Ethereum murders it. Well, by what? Fair, like fair point. <laughs> like, can you do NFTs on Bitcoin? No. Can you do stable coins in Bitcoin? No. Can you do Listen, smart contracts? In Bitcoin? It's trash. Yeah. This is the guy. I'm the guy who sold all my Bitcoin to buy ETH. So you don't, there you, have to go. you don't have to convince yeah. me. I'm just saying. No, but it's the audience, right? Like the audience hears this shit like like this false equivalence. Like you have to give time to both sides. Like we have to give time to like evolution and to like the turtle that's holding the earth up. Like, no, you don't get equal time for shit that sucks. Shit that sucks sucks. Like Bitcoin sucks. It made a fucking, it's lower now than it was five years ago. You held that dog shit for five years to lose money. Why the fuck would anyone buy that? It's trash. It's had two inflation bugs where anyone could mint as many free coins as they wanted. Yet people say it's never been hacked. Yes, it has. They say it's uncensored. I'd say, say it's fucking uh, 
Bitcoin, hold on, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin. I, I know we're going to go back to the agenda, but Bitcoin's been hacked? Yes, twice. Once they had to roll back the fucking chain in 2010 because someone minted 6 billion extra coins. Oops. And the second time, it was responsibly disclosed by someone that could have just minted all the free Bitcoin they wanted, but instead told the devs, and the devs patched it saying it was a denial of service attack, but it was actually a mint as many free Bitcoin as you fucking want attack. Well, and that was just was two that? or three years ago. The second Oh, shit. Okay. That was just two or three years ago. It's spaghetti code with no fucking written spec. Like, it's, it's dog shit, but everyone thinks it's good. They're like, no. It's, it's, it's had critical vulnerabilities out the ass constantly. There's no, no bug bounty program, no written spec. Peter Woolley just stopped being on the... Like, people don't know shit about Bitcoin, dude. I've been in this since 2011, mined full Bitcoin blocks in my own solo, and, like, no one knows what the fuck they're talking about in regards to Bitcoin. It's crazy to me. I love this. Oh, I, think we're gonna have this. I think we're gonna have a heck of a debate. Yeah, fuck. Um, how many people do we have in so far? One point three k. Thirteen, thirteen hundred people already, man. Perfect. So yeah, man, just uh, don't interrupt me, and uh, let's kick it off. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> um, I'm yeah. Okay. So, so f no. For those unaware, uh, I just, I like, I like, I was interrupted, like. I don't know, four times? Man, we had a, anyone, hold on, Ryan, Ryan, you were there, Ryan, just two seconds, Ryan, you were there in the last, and Joe, and, Ma, and, and I think it's Rebecca from Magic Eden, was it Rebecca, or I got the name wrong? If I did, uh, Tiff. I'm really sorry. Tiff from Magic Eden. That's so sorry, funny. Tiffany, Tiffany. <laughs> I'm Tiffany, bad, sorry. But I am Tiffany, nice to be back. Uh, Tiffany, did I, to be honest, Tiffany, Ryan, and Joe, did I interrupt Kirill too much last night? If yes, I don't mind. We yes. had a whole dis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nah, well, I swear, like a hundred percent. Poor KK, I tell you. Ryan, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I swear. Like, just speaking, I've, speaking the truth. I've been trying to have to like fucking prove this point like over the whole week. Like we're just adding people into calls. Like, did he interrupt? Yes or no? And I'm like, yes. And I'm like, no. And the next one, yes. The next one, no. It's like I don't. I, I thought I was going crazy. But all the people we added in the call are people I pay. They're in my company, so they're gonna go on my side, anyways. So. Mar Mario is so exactly wasn't... like Tanya. He's just saying, "Wait, wait a minute, just just a minute," and and then and he's like, "KK, I need you," and then you just interrupt him all the time. So just just <laughs> speak, know, know. speaking <laughs> the truth here. <laughs> all right, KK, you got me, there, man. Right, yeah, the mic is yours, KK. When you're finished talking, just say over, so I know that I can speak, please, man. No problem, man. Man, you can actually leave the phone in another room and go do some exercise, like jog or something. It's okay, don't worry. It's all right. Anyways, all right. So, um, welcome all to the fifth episode of our Crypto Roundtable. Um, today, uh, like, just from the start as well, from the start of the conversation, evidently today is going to be a little bit crazy, uh, especially with the Bitcoin maximalist and Bitcoin minimalist debate that we have coming up. And we also have a heck of an agenda whipped up, plus some super interesting panelists that are going to be coming up on stage. So we'll be taking off shortly with a market analysis segment where we'll essentially have Intel dropped on the latest price movements, predictions for BTC and ETH, as well as some info dropped on the latest developments in macroeconomics, so the CPU. PI reports, etc. Uh, today's title for the roundtable is the dark side of Bitcoin and crypto. And that's exactly why we have the market analysis segment followed up by a Bitcoin debate section where panelists will be given the ability to discuss the downsides of Bitcoin. That's one. And, and, and the downsides, the downsides, <laughs> the downsides, hold on, you've got, you've got downsides of NFTs as well. We're going to go into the, you know, you know wash trading, money laundering, etc. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, so this will then be followed by Simon Dixon's Celsius segment, where he'll update us on the latest happening with Celsius and the DeFi meltdown as well. We sort of dove deeper into that throughout episode four, but because of the constraints of the agenda, we sort of had to cut it short, but we've dedicated a full half an hour for this just so that Simon can explain exactly what's happening. And lastly, we'll have it all rounded up with a trends and opportunity section where we'll be discussing the latest trends and opportunities in the crypto market as well. Now, throughout the segments, we'll be giving away, and Mario, correct me if I'm wrong, here uh 10,000 US dollars worth of crypto and project tokens to a select number of lucky listeners that will stay so we got we got five what five thousand dollars five thousand dollars worth of, worth of just USDT and then five thousand dollars worth of faith tribe tokens which was one of our sponsors a couple of shows ago and one of the projects we work closely with so faith a lot of people love faith as well so uh, we thought we'll bring them in and we'll do that we'll start giving away project tokens project we're invested in not just some shit coins uh, as part of the giveaways and maybe some nfts as well now, rather than just pure fiat. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a good intro. And, and um, 
also just remember for everyone that we have a Telegram group now. I'm going to pin the, the, the message. So we, we launched, that's actually fascinating. Do you mind, KK? I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Really didn't mean to interrupt. I hope it's not, it, it just it doesn't offend you in any way. <laughs> but I wanted to introduce the Telegram group as well for everyone. Did you so pin it? Yeah, did you pin it or not? No, I'll, I'll pin it in a sec. I've got the tweet ready. Uh, but for everyone listening, so what we did, and for anyone that hasn't done their space, one thing you could do, I did it first time on Clubhouse, is create a backdoor, a community where everyone can chat. We did it on Telegram and it just blew up. I mean, we've got 42,000 members in two weeks. Um, we did a fireside chat, there's like 5,000 active members there. So we're going to pin the chat in the Telegram. To win, you know, to be part of the $10,000 in giveaways, you have to join the Telegram as well. It's one of the requirements. And we're going to also announce Discord. So we have a lot of people waiting for Discord. We're going to announce Discord. They're going to do giveaways on Discord as well. So I'm going to be pinning a link right now for everyone, everyone listening. And if you go there, you go to the Telegram group, Discord group. You can ask questions, debate. And, you know, we're going to have a lot of heated discussions. Don't hesitate to participate in those discussions. We're going to be reading your questions and, and seeing your perspectives as well as the audience. So, uh, so I'm going to pin that now. I think as per the, the heated discussions as well, the, the best thing that we could do is just keep it like constructive and relevant above all, other than just, you know, a bunch of panelists just shouting at each other. Because, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's going to be a, a good experience for the audience itself. But as I was mentioning, so throughout the segments, we'll be giving away $10K worth of crypto and project tokens uh, to a select number of lucky listeners that stay with us from the beginning till the end. As always, our team is basically scouring the listener notes and making sure, you know, that the, the people are there that are there are eligible. So they followed all the links and they're with us from the beginning till the end. So basically, it's going to suck big time if we listed you as a winner and you're not there to claim the prize because we'll just have to choose someone else. To participate, you also have to join all the links that Mario's pinning above, which he hasn't pinned yet, but I think he's on it. As per the roundtable, the past four weeks have been a major success with all four episodes being listened to by approximately 150,000 people, if I'm not mistaken. So give or take. Last week's episode was on Solana versus Ethereum, and that episode alone had 40k people tuned in. We had some super valuable conversations with thought leaders from both sides on whether Solana is better than Ethereum from a blockchain and community perspective. You can find that episode on Mario's profile. Today though, we're switching things up with key points of focus being Bitcoin, an NFT hour, Celsius, and more. And we've got some special guests with us today, including Richard Hart, who was a former Bitcoin maximalist slash evangelist, but then went ahead to create his own coin or coins, if I should say, especially with Pulse being released right now. Then we also have Simon Dixon joining us, who's actively helping Celsius with their recovery plan and a couple of, couple of others, which I'll announce along the way. And we've got some nice questions lined up for them throughout the duration of the show as well. And for the roundtable, for those unaware, again, uh, probably the last time I say this, it was the biggest room on Clubhouse during Clubhouse's inception. Mario, our host, had tens of thousands of listeners in each room and was hosting rooms alongside some of the world's biggest celebrities and thought leaders, including Paris Hilton, Jay Shetty, and others. But after taking a short break to get NFT tech listed on the Canadian and European stock market, we're finally back and we decided to move the show onto Twitter spaces instead. I, for those who don't know me, I'm a growth hacker, which is basically a fancy term for a marketer and a bit of a crypto and Web3 enthusiast, and I'll be co-hosting episode five alongside Mario. As mentioned before, giveaway prizes, etc. Now, major shout out to the sponsor of this space, NFT Tech. I think Mario can expand on NFT Tech more as he was the actual co-founder of the company itself. Yeah, I will in a second. Also, I've got Andy. I want, I want to introduce Andy to the audience. Came in last minute. Really glad you managed to come in, Andy, especially with your involvement with the recent uh, you know, DeFi liquidations and your insight there. So um, we didn't have you on the guest list because I thought you won't be able to join, but thanks a lot for joining, man. I appreciate it. Andy, are you Andy with us? there? Can you hear me? I feel like God love her. He's there. He heard us. Yes, yes. I'm, thanks, I'm around. I'm around. Thanks, I Mario. appreciate being here. Yeah, so NFT Tech, everyone, uh, is the sponsor. It's listed on the Canadian and European stock market. I co-founded the company and uh, was the CEO for a period of time until it went public. Um, and it's essentially like a portfolio company. So any retail investor could buy shares in NFT Tech to have exposure to the space. And one of the few companies doing this for NFTs, you know, we've got a lot of you know, index funds for, for Bitcoin, for ETH. Um, but no one's, not many people have done this yet for NFTs. So that's what NFT Tech did. We launched it about a year and a half ago. But enough about NFT tech, man. Let's kick it off with the uh, market analysis, KK. Then we'll introduce the guests and we'll start digging into the topic. 
perfect, 100%. Romy, in the meantime, just make sure that you're adding one of the relevant people for this segment of the show, just so that we can kick it off. And yeah, uh, I guess we'll uh, we'll basically hop into the market analysis segment of the show. So a quick wrap up of just what's happening right now, for those unaware. Bitcoin has been steadily forming lower lows and lower highs throughout the entirety of this week. The price seems to be slowly decreasing to retest the demand zone at 18K after a short-term rally towards the 21K mark. Ethereum, on the other hand, has dropped to its 1K levels, with the support of 1,000 being the critical part over the last few days. On a macro scale of things, the Euro-Dollar pair has broken parity, with EURUSD reaching 1.01 yesterday. And the US has released a CPI of 9.1% for June, which is basically the highest rate in 41 years, causing the stock market to fall. Now, as you all know, when stocks drop, people don't hedge with crypto despite what we'd like it to be. So crypto falls too. And this is basically contributing to the bleed off we're seeing right now in the market. I'd love to get the thoughts of the panelists though, with regards to just what's happening from a market perspective. I'll kick it off with uh, Joe. John, you did a market analysis last time. You want to kick it off for this, um, for this, uh, for the show? Yeah, definitely. First, uh, you know, thanks Mario and KK for inviting me here. Enjoyed it last time. I'll do, you know, a quick market analysis and then got to drop for, for other calls. But two major topics that I wanted to cover uh, this time around. First one is, and it's very fitting with the, the title of the space, the dark side of Bitcoin and crypto. Many people, I think, view Bitcoins and crypto's volatility as, you know, something that, that scares them. And it's, you know, a bug of the system. I, I like to argue that that. Bitcoin's volatility is a feature, not a bug. And so I, I kind of come to the conclusion that these extreme bull and bear markets of Bitcoin are a feature and they speed up the adoption process. So, you know, the average person doesn't doesn't know this or may not be aware, but, you know, the 2017 Bitcoin bubble and the 2021 Bitcoin bubble that we had were not the first time we saw this significant price rise and, and rapid decline. You know, there, there have been countless other bubbles. In 2011, it, it rose from a dollar to $30, crashed 92% back to $2. Uh, 2012 and 2013, it rose from $2 up to 250 crashed to 62 which is a 75% decline. Uh, 2013, 2014, it rose from 62 over to over 1000 dropped back to 154 which is an 86% decline. So, like I said, these massive price advances along with the massive declines are you know exactly how i think bitcoin adoption will continue to play out these the bull markets bring in the network effects including you know technology development investment you know ice fidelity and securities or security for miners um the bear market drives out all of those who really don't understand what bitcoin is so they you know sell it and, and deeply regret it later and I think this exact cycle is kind of going to repeat itself until weak hands are purged. People that, you know, don't understand Bitcoin or, or maybe they were too leveraged um, going into a, a, you know, a bear market. And I think the only people remaining, uh, you know, after Bitcoin falls 80% are really those comfortable holding Bitcoin. And I think the only ones left buying after it has fallen 80% are those well capitalized and uh, have strong balance sheets and they're in it for the long run. So that's my like general take on why I think that, you know, Bitcoin volatility is actually a feature and not a bug and it's, you know, speeding up the adoption process. Second major point that I wanted to make um, for this market analysis section is the whole debate on whether Bitcoin is an inflation hedge or a debasement hedge. So, you know, many people have kind of said that Bitcoin has, has failed as an inflation hedge. You know, we just saw, you know, we just had a uh, record CPI reading this week. It came in at 9.1%, uh, which was, you know, a 40 year high. But meanwhile, <laughs> Bitcoin is down significantly from its all time high of 69,000. And in my opinion, I think a better way to describe Bitcoin is it's a monetary debasement hedge rather than an inflation hedge. So I think, you know, CPI is a backward looking metric. It, de it describes what consumer prices have done, you know, over the past 12 months. However, I think markets are, are forward looking metrics. Markets are trying to measure what's going to happen in the future. And so in this case, Bitcoin certainly has held its 
narrative as this monetary debasement or inflation hedge because you know we've had massive government stimulus massive federal reserve easing which occurred in 2020 and 2021 bitcoin benefited greatly during those times and now that the monetary stimulus is clearly being reflected in consumer prices it, it, it took some time for that to manifest as you know businesses don't all immediately raise their prices at once and and since 2021 bitcoin has has fallen because the fed has clearly said that they're turning off their easy money policies in an attempt to to slow this inflation that took time to manifest and since the the bitcoin market and the us equities market is forward looking the market is pricing in a, an aggressive hawkish fed and so to sum it up i think cpi it, it looks backward and Bitcoin and equity markets look forward. And whenever the Fed inevitably reverses course and tries to stimulate once again, I think Bitcoin will be one of the best assets to own. Joe, for the audience, could you explain the difference between a debasement hedge and an inflation inflation hedge as well? Yeah, absolutely. So kind of like I was mentioning, in 2020, we saw the Federal Reserve and, you know, the U.S. You know, central government, uh, get really aggressive, pushing, pushing out stimulus checks, dropping interest rates to zero, doing massive quantitative easing. We saw that occur back in 2020 and 2021. Like I said, markets, whether it's the US equity market, stocks, or, or the Bitcoin market or the crypto market, markets are forward looking. So when that occurred, that debasement of the dollar occurred back in 2020 and 2021, um, that's when Bitcoin started to, you know, look forward to see this, hey, inflation is coming, like this debasement is happening now. Let's price that in into the Bitcoin market, into the U.S. equity market. So Bitcoin had that fantastic run up, you know, throughout 2020 uh, and 2021. You know, it, it went from its $3,000 or 3,000s low uh, in March 2020 up to, you know, 69000 at the end of uh, 2021. Um, but then, you know, we... We had this inflation manifest, which now we're potentially seeing, you know, or we're seeing record highs of it. But since the end of 2021, the Fed has kind of reversed course and they have taken a much more hawkish stance, meaning they're they're raising interest rates and they're they're starting quantitative tightening. Um, so, like I said, the market is forward looking. The Fed is trying to tackle inflation aggressively now, and that's really um what's been, you know, bringing down asset prices. Can you also, because uh, I know that recently a topic of conversation has been how CPI is measured. So how consumer price index is basically measured. Can you expand on that? And can you also expand on whether you think it could be measured better? Because I remember hearing a uh, snippet on a YouTube video about uh, employees of the government basically going to shops with a tablet and just identifying the prices and working out some average. Can you talk about that a bit as well? Yeah, sure. So yeah, there's definitely a lot of, you know, debate on how to accurately measure consumer prices. And I think Michael Saylor has a, like a great quote on this. Inflation is a vector. You know, it's not something that you can just boil down to one number. It kind of depends on everyone individually what they buy where they live where they buy or rent their house what foods they consume and so if you're consuming different food, goods and services compared to other people you might be experiencing a different inflation rate so i think at the end of the day it kind of comes down to the government or, or the federal reserve is is trying to i guess identify that inflation number in a very concise manner but there's, it's honestly just impossible to do, in my opinion. And I think, you know, in the long run, when with technology growth and, and processes getting better, population growing, uh, more division of labor, I think, you know, we really should see prices coming down, right? Like things should be getting more efficient. Food should be getting cheaper. Like if we have self-driving cars um, then or self-driving trucks, then we should be able to see goods and services delivered to us in a more cheaper manner and, and in the long run prices should actually be coming down so it's it's kind of this interesting uh division where the the monetary system that we have today is you know focused on pushing prices slowly up over time but we have this you know technology deflation which is 
just market reality, which should actually be pushing prices down over time. And I think we're kind of seeing this unique division um, and and two two forces pushing in the opposite direction and it's causing a lot of problems. Mario, do you have anything to add to this? Also, another one for yeah, the panel. So, uh, and I'll just, I'll add it later. Go ahead. Man. No, I was just going to say, get different perspectives on this as well. So I know like Andy, Richard, you guys and Ryan, you guys have been in the space for a long time um, and would love your take on, you know, do you see things differently this time? Or is it just another correction and, and uh, just a matter of time before we see the, the market recover? I think this is just another correction. I mean, we anyone who's been investing for any period of time just knows that there are cycles and this is just another one. The world's not going to end. Um, it, you know, it's, everything's going to be fine if you're, if you're holding good assets, right? Um, like the reason why I particularly hold ETH versus Bitcoin, and again, I'm not an ETH maxi, is just because everybody that I know in the space that's building, that's building, 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 builders, just don't understand uh, the utility of Bitcoin other than uh, you know, land, uh, an asset that you hold that will go up, you know, ETH and Ethereum is obviously uh, what you build on. So th that's why I've always uh, focused on Ethereum and ETH, but um, this is just a cycle is my opinion, like obviously not financial advice, but but the underlying asset is good. And you you should, everybody should do the, the cash flow analysis on the Ethereum blockchain itself. Like it actually generates cash post merge, like, so this is a good foundation to build on. So I'm, I believe I'm the same with NFTs, like good NFTs are going to, are going to hold their value and grow. Um, you know, you buy ETH at a thousand, you buy a good project. Uh, uh, that's an NFT. ETH will, will appreciate over time. The project will appreciate over time. And, and uh, if you're patient, it should work out. Now there's a lot of, a lot of low quality assets out there. Um, and I think, uh, those won't recover, but I, I'm just going to be patient. Does Does anyone disagree with the? You know, we all we've said this before. Like quality NFT projects are here to stay. Projects with a strong community are here to stay. Does anyone disagree? I with disagree. That? Yeah, I disagree entirely. So, <clears throat> Ethereum benefits like internally. So, the more developers that develop on Ethereum, the more projects that use it, the more it acts as a, a base liquidity layer for Uniswap or Sushi or whatever, the the more rare the Ethereum coins get and the larger the float of, like, all these projects need to have some of the ETH to do the stuff they want to do, and so it creates a float. So even if they don't want to necessarily be speculating in it, they still need to have it. And that all increases demand. And so, like, when you bring on new projects to Ethereum, it doesn't create uh, as strong a substitute good. But with NFTs, the substitute goods are are just more strict. So, you know, you buy one monkey picture, someone else makes a toxic monkey picture, and then someone takes makes a monkey picture GAN, and then it's very hard to see how someone else's monkey picture pumping in price actually should affect your monkey picture's price. And so I, th I think it's a lot easier to dilute the monkey picture market with more pictures um, than it is to be like, oh, like we'll, we'll just make another ETH. I think it's a lot harder. I know it's a lot harder because I'm making another ETH. So, <laughs> Well, but, but Richard, you're, you're, you're sort of classifying all NFTs as monkey pictures. You, you, you obviously don't believe that, right? Yeah, I, I do. What, what well, are the then you need, then you need to, then, then you need to research the NFT market. I mean, no, NFTs, you can just teach NFTs me now. Are a, I'm ready. Okay, NFTs are a technology, right? They're, oh, they're well. not a JPEG. So uh, you got to look well. at what the, the technology can do. They're, they're well. tokenized assets. You, so you're going to try and you're going to try and defend you're going to try, and defend, you're gonna try and defend monkey pictures with ERC seven twenty one. No, and it's no, actual utility that no one uses. I don't own any Yuga assets, so no, I'm not defending monkey pictures when I'm. I got I'm talking well, about this 721. So, so let's be serious that in actuality, apart from the technological argument, they really are just fake gambling. It's just fake gambling. You guys are buying loot crates. You're, you're buying uh, gun skins in uh, Counter-Strike and hoping the price pumps. 
with well, maybe you're, you're, less counterparty risk, maybe. No, no maybe. You're, confla- you're conflating the technology with what people are doing with it now. Like those are two separate things. Yeah, so. but people are, but but people aren't buying your future optional fantasy reality that you think will happen one day. They're buying monkey pictures now. So you're just well, dreaming. Well, that's what they like, do, but that's people are getting wrecked the now, internet. and you're saying it's okay they're getting wrecked now because it'll be okay later somehow. Like, no, no, no it's not I, okay. I, just, so I didn't so say it was getting... okay now. <laughs> they said people well, not okay. like, being yeah, by so, so Richard, I have, a, I have a question for you. The concept of digital ownership, the ability to own something virtually without a central entity saying you own it, as a technology, do you not see value in that technology? You, you guys understand that that's not what NFTs are? Let me, let me explain to you guys what NFTs are. An NFT is a serial number loosely related to a JPEG, which may or may not still be hosted on the internet and at any time can be swapped to dick pics. Unless you use IPFS, and that's it. And most projects don't even do that. So you, you, you know, you're not even buying the intellectual property. You don't have the rights. And I, by the way, am putting the F in NFT because when I fork Ethereum, all of your NFTs are coming as well. And so you think they're non-fungible, but I'm making them fungible because I'm giving you another copy on a new chain. So how's your fungibility doing? So it's weird that I'm like, I'm like down talking my own bag, like hurting my own business by like alienating the NFT guys by just saying like, hey guys, I'm, I'm making your shit fungible. So, you know, if you buy an NFT in the future, I hope you're getting the Pulse Chain copy too. Because it's going to suck for you to have to argue with the seller when he sells you the ETH copy and he sells somebody else the Pulse Chain copy. I would want both my copies. And I mean, like, NFT so guys wait, don't wait, like Richard, getting robbed by Richard, fees you're, either. Richard, you're building another version of Ethereum? Like, what are you talking about? It's already about? done. It's already well, done. No it's one been knows in testnet about it for or like, uses it. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. Is, but it raised a billion point. dollars. That's how smart you are. That's, That's how that smart you are, dude. That it raised a billion anything. dollars with a B. There were $680 million of stable coins sitting in the two sacrifice addresses. So tell me how smart you are and how up to date you are. I raised $27 million for charity. Did you know that? You probably didn't because you actually don't know much. So, 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 so Richard, the, the, I know you're referring to Hex, yeah? No, absolutely not. This has nothing to do with Hex at all. Pulse so chain. you guys don't, are you guys crazy? Holy shit. So go, go to pulsechain.com, go into MetaMask, put the settings in there, and go fuck around with all your free coins. They're all sitting there. All of your coins that you have Ethereum are already sitting in the testnet. You can go trade them. And people have been trading them back and forth and having fun on the testnet for like six months or longer. And we would already be in mainnet, except my devs found some denial of service attacks they want to close up. We could launch without doing that and just hope no one attacks, but I don't feel like going down all the time like Solana. I'd rather stay up all the time like Hex. So so I'm not, I don't want to like, I hate alienating all the NFT guys because I'm giving you a free copy of all your shit on a new chain with no AML, no KYC, no sign up. It all just fucking works. But I still think overpaying for serial numbers loosely related to JPEGs is stupid. No, but I think and the technological like argument that one day you could use it to secure other shit is retarded. No one cares right now. Yeah, but no one cares right now. I think that the technological benefits of NFTs go way beyond looking at, at JPEG pictures of monkeys. You know, I've been against the whole... I was against monkeys at a stupid time, you know, when I could have invested in punks and apes and ignored the, 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 the value of building a community around it. But then even, you know, I see value in those PFPs. The, do you see value in having a digital identity represented by one of those NFTs? Assuming no, it's horrible. The, the NFT, why is it horrible? Because, like, you don't even own the fucking property rights. Like, the actual property right owner could come and file a fucking claim against you and remove your stupid NFT from you that you think you kind of maybe own, but you really don't. You're pretending you own it. You have no fucking rights to it. You don't actually own shit. You're just pretending that you do. And you get mad when other people copy-paste your shit and pretend with you. We have real well, ownership depends. of things. I really own the Hex logo. Like, well, a company really owns it. But, like, it, it's really owned. It's not, it's not fantasy shit where you get rug pulled and, and they just point the server somewhere else. They can just take your JPEGs that you think you own and point them to dick pics and you could cry about it. It's the stupidest shit I've ever seen. I, I'd be happy to have a, a conversation without swearing and, and kind of oh my inf- God. Inf- inflaming this no. whole thing. Oh and my this, God, dude. This doesn't oh, feel oh, like a Can you explain to me what's wrong with cursing? Like, 
Are no, you a, are you a, are you a school kid? Are you an elementary school, no, buddy? No, Richard, Richard, but Richard, Richard, I would agree. Like, like when we brought you on stage, and I've been watching you since the early days, and you know you've got an incredible audience. But there's a lot of people that get alienated by the confrontational nature of of, um, of presenting a point. Yeah, but you guys are um, so costing why, people their life savings, and you think it's funny. Like, we're not. We're not. We've never. We're not. We've never shilled a project before. We never will shill a project. Now I know there are people in this space that you know, pointing them out and pointing out the, the imperfections of the space is the purpose of of the show today. And we had a list of things that are wrong with NFTs. But there's, you know, so just to, to kind of differentiate ourselves from the people that pump projects. I've never shilled a project. I don't. Ryan hasn't um, either, and he's invested a lot in the space. But also get your point, and, and then looking at you know, I'll curse millions. less, but if you're selling people, if you're you're overcharging people for serial numbers related to JPEGs, I don't like it. And I'm going to give everyone a copy of your stuff for free, so enjoy. So, so Ryan, what would be your take on the on on, on Richard's point regarding the the his concerns with NFTs as a technology? I honestly need to research uh, the technology he's talking about. I, I haven't heard of it till today, so I need, I need time to do that to have an intelligent response. But this doesn't feel, I don't feel like I'm talking to someone who is open-minded, so I'm, I'm not going to engage anymore. All right, cool. Well, well, Richard, I think this is a, a discussion that's worth having and preparing for for maybe a future show. Would you be up to going on a different space where we discuss that exact concern that you have and the point that you've made? And then we bring in some people deep in the NFT space, some heavy investors in the space to go through that, uh, through, through those points. Richard, you up for that? Richard, you there? You don't have to curse, but you can unmute if you want to answer. Oh, I was muted. Nice. Yeah, oh, hey, yeah. uh, I think that other guy is a coward. I don't know why he's such a baby. And yes, I'm happy to debate anybody. Cool. Right, okay, okay. Do you want to go through the agenda, man? That, that took a massive... Yeah, let's go. Level. Get the next point. <laughs> We're just supposed to have NFT hour, and like Magic Eden just bailed as well because of the conversation. <laughs> it's crazy. Hey, <laughs> no, hey, welcome to the internet, guys. We got thick skin here. We've got we've got two thousand eight hundred people, or no, two thousand seven hundred and fifty people listening to the space. I mean, it's our biggest space yet. So uh, obviously, obviously, the audience is enjoying the discussion. So for, for the audience members, actually, I'd love different perspectives on this. We have the the Telegram and the Discord groups pinned in the space at the top. So go in there. Anyone that wants to debate the points made by Richard, welcome to bring you up. We have Tony Wu joining later on as well uh, to discuss a few points as well. And Richard, I think you'd have a, a strong opinion on those points. But yeah, so while everyone's doing this, okay, okay, let's, let's get through the agenda, man. Are you ready for, are you, are you ready for NFT hour? <laughs> no, no, man. I think we'll go through directly to Bitcoin first. And then we can talk about NFT hour later because I think all the NFT guys it just kind of freaked out. Magic Eden awesome. just, just went, Magic Eden just went poof. It's like, what the no, fuck? I was expecting them to like, Tiffany. I don't know, like debate or something. <laughs> yeah, Tiffany will join back. I'll bring you in. But I'll, I'll let you go on with the agenda. And for everyone listening, just remember, make sure you follow all the speakers. You know, we've got 2,700 people. We usually get 40, 50,000 listeners per show, including replay. So make sure you follow all the speakers. You join the Telegram and the Discord community to be part of the giveaways. And if you have any questions, any points you make, if you want to go up and speak as well, um, definitely let us know in the group. We've got the team watching the Discord and Telegram groups. Again, check the pinned tweet at the top of the space to join. There's a link there. But let's go through the first point, KK, in the agenda. You want to flip it uh, from NFT hour to the Bitcoin debate? Or how do you want to <laughs> Yeah, we'll go to the Bitcoin debate, and then we'll get some NFT guys to come in and get a debate going. Or do you want to protect NFTs? You choose. <laughs> no, no. We'll talk about NFTs afterwards. We'll kick it off with Bitcoin and crypto. I would love the Bitcoin thing, man, because like the NFT dudes just they don't want to hear what I got to say, bro. The Bitcoin Richard, thing. Uh, we'll, we'll get... apart, apart from the tech, and I know that tech is the fucking fundamental part of it, because if the tech doesn't work, then everything goes to shit. But because I, I'm not a I'm not a blockchain dev, the, the technical part sort of evades me. But you don't believe in any of the applications at all, even if the tech was you know, so, fully so I can explain it to you. Like, I love to educate, so I, I can explain this like really clearly. When people create NFT, pro okay, blockchains are just really expensive, really slow databases. That's all they are. Period. They're the most expensive, slowest, crappiest databases in the world. They have hidden bit rot. There's a fork that just removes your your data. You have to run your own computer offline to make sure that your data is still there because it might have been orphaned off in a fork. When you try and write to the database, sometimes it doesn't go through. 
because the blocks are full, or sometimes it doesn't go through because your transaction got dropped, or sometimes it doesn't go through because you didn't bid for enough gas. And so it's actually a horrible, terrible nightmare for doing any type of development. The only reason that we endure any of this pain and horror to develop on these platforms of the world's slowest and most expensive databases is for censorship resistance. And so NFT projects run into a problem. And the problem is they want to issue people JPEGs. And JPEGs take X number of bytes. And if they, cost, if they, if they add up the size of all their procedurally generated garbage art and add it all up, you end up with like maybe a gig of data. And then if you see what it costs to write a gig of data to the blockchain, you can't afford to do it. It costs too much. You'd go cash negative. And so what they do instead is they take the JPEGs and they store them offline in a normal web server. And then they store a hash of the JPEG on the uh, blockchain because it's much smaller. But you're having got the thick, but you got you got IPFS as a solution. You got other solutions. Yeah, I know. Developed. Yeah, sure. Right. That barely anyone uses, but they should use. Can you? It is can you explain IP, IP, IPFS to the audience? Yeah. As well? So what IP, Otherwise, we just want yeah, to. Yeah. So all all IPFS is is a web server, but it's based on the hash of what's being stored. So so a hash is just a way to identify something, and then so like. You take all the numbers that make up the picture and you run them through this code and then you get a new number that's a lot smaller. So, so it's like looking at a book. You look at the book and you're like, okay, I'm going to call this book uh, the Bible. And then like that's the hash of that book. And then you're, you know, I mean, it's not the best example because there's different translations and what, but basically you can identify a big set of data by a much smaller set of data. It's just a name for it, right? But the name doesn't have collisions. So like it's a unique name that will it will always equal that thing. So anyway, they store so IPFS is just a way to store data on a web server, but access it by the hash of what it is so that you know what you're pulling up is really the thing that you wanted. So it's, it's like kind of perfectly built for NFTs, basically. And so for projects that use IPFS, at least there's a chance that what you think is yours really still is hosted on the internet somewhere. But with these projects that have centralized servers, they can make your NFTs whatever they want by just changing the thing on the server, because you you don't they you have some serial number that lives on the blockchain, and then their server lets you think it equals some JPEG, but they can just change that data and it could equal some other JPEG whenever they want, and that's not trustless and that's not crypto. So, you know, for NFT projects that that actually use IPFS, that's kind of crypto, right? Um, it's it's harder for a middleman to come in there and just steal all your stuff. But these, these projects that don't use IPFS, they could just steal all your stuff. They could just give it to somebody else. They could hold it for ransom. They could yes. be like, hey. I, 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 agree with you. I, think, I think this is... Go ahead, man. I wanted to say, what about on-chain? Like, on-chain software? Well, there's not enough space. You can't because well, there's not but, enough space. But on -chain The blockchain is not big enough to store all the JPEGs. It can't. It just well, fills all up. All I'm saying is, on-chain monkeys, let's say if we take on-chain monkeys, they're the perfect example of the shit is legit. I mean, like, th there's no argument there. Well, no, the, the, the argument is, so you, you, you have reduced your counterparty risk, but now you still have, we're really just playing roulette, but instead of numbers on a wheel, we have monkey pictures. Like, it's just obfuscated gambling. There's no actual technical innovation. It's, it's, pure, it's just greater full. So, like, Bitcoin's technical innovation was that it was the first peer-to-peer -peer censorship-resistant kind of attempt at digital cash, and it failed at that, but ended up being digital gold, and that was worth more, so yay. And then Ethereum was like, we're going to do the same thing Bitcoin did, but instead of just using the Bitcoin opcodes, you're going to be able to do turn complete stuff and do, do a lot more computation. And that opened up the floodgates of creativity. So now you've got options, you've got time deposits, you've got uh, peer-to-peer -peer trading, DEXs, you know, everything. Like, you know, that opened up the sky's the limit. And then when when they opened up that Pandora's box, it released a lot of bad things, right? So you have a million rug pulls now. And it, you know, maybe released a lot of good things. We'll see what gets up after the bear market, right? Everything pumps in the bear market. Trash pumps, scams pump. And then the bear market comes. I meant to say bull if I didn't. So during the bull market, everything pumps. And then during the bear market, everything dumps. And I do mean everything. And then it's like, what will get back up? And some things won't get back up. Like Luna's not going to get back up. Uh, you know, but like probably Dogecoin would. So even though Dogecoin's down like, I don't know, 85% or something, 
it probably will get back up because it's done it for so many years. So even though it's not good technology, it has product market fit. It has a little bit of a walled garden due to its memes. And then that's enough to get back up. It doesn't have critical technical failures. But there's a lot of things that do have critical technical failures. So, so just because, you know, and it, just because IPFS solves counterparty risk, it doesn't solve this was a bad idea and overpriced in the first place kind of bubble risk. So bubble risk is different True. from counterparty risk. Richard, True. other True. than the expensive apes and just the, the pictures and everything, if we talk about uh, alternative NFT applications, like f I'll just choose one random from the top of my head, like a uh, uh, access to a certain community. For yeah, instance. they're all great. I, I think those Digital are all fabulous, iPhone. but no one's using them for that. You're, so in a world yet, where you're medical. tokenizing access and shit, it's fabulous. But like, yes. you don't have to overpay for access. You don't have to overpay for serial numbers loosely related to pictures. You know, you know, like the price is the main issue. And that's why most people are in crypto. If these NFTs don't, didn't have prices and weren't easily tradable, no one would buy them. It's, it's, it's pseudo gambling. I actually, I actually agree with Richard on this one. Uh, on the aspect of alternate, like a, I don't fully have an understanding of the tech, but with regards to alternative use cases, such as like community access and that type of stuff, where it's more down to earth from so, a price. No, a community, even, yo, yo, community, but community access is actually just, even that is boring cake. Sorry to interrupt. But I was going to say like, even like you've got so many applications of, of NFT as a technology. And I think Richard, what you're saying, like if you're, if you're using NFTs to tokenize your medical records. Well, I can give you a identity. perfect example of a good use of an NFT, like right now. So if you, if you use Uniswap V3 and you open a liquidity provider position, you are issued an NFT that represents your liquidity provider position. And it even comes with a funny picture. And exactly. so exactly. all of your liquidity positions in Uniswap V3 are NFTs. That's fine. That's, that's wonderful. I have no problem with that. Someone else tokenized uh, hex stakes and made them you know, one level of abstraction larger so they act like bonds. And those are NFTs. And so like, there are layer two technical ways to use NFTs that have nothing to do with JPEGs that are you know, fine. So, so perfect. So you look at the current state of the NFT market, you know, unsustainable, Ponzi-nomic schemes, you know, a lot of scams. But as a technology, if it's sure. used properly, yep. there's a lot of great utilities there. You agree. Man, you yes, make, I agree you with make that. Your point. I, I, I'm going to let Andy speak because I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad he's here as well. So Andy, before I give you the mic, I just want to say, Richard, like you've got a very unique way of making your point. They're good points. Like when you start digging through it, you, you get to a good point. Usually we agree. Um, but your way of making those points... Man, you rub a lot of people the wrong way. But, uh, I'm like the I'm like the Kool Aid guy that comes through the wall. You know, if the Kool Aid still tastes good. <laughs> Andy, uh, the mic is yours, man. No, I, I I think Richard is being very direct. You know, I I I echo to some of his comments on uh, you know the the actual usage of a blockchain and and whether there's a real need to have a business case. You know, using you know, using blockchain or building on blockchain because I, I give advice to governments. I give advice to, to listed companies. Uh, I realize the biggest problem is uh, everybody is just here for the fact, you know, just, just, just for the fun of it, right? And they do not really know exactly, you know, the kind of cost that is behind it. You know, taking another step uh, backwards, you know, I, I, have, I have friends, you know, uh, who say that, oh, you know, uh, STO, for example, securities uh, token are the best thing, you know, because there's no need to go through the middleman. There's, there's, it's, it's a lot cheaper. There's no need to go through the audit. But again, these are all bullshit because there are other costs incurred, you know, for you to be listed on an on an exchange, and and it's, it's not and it's not too much cheaper, you know, as compared to a to a real standard, you know, traditional uh, listing, right? So I I think that that I agree with. Uh, with uh, Richard, but uh, one one thing that I, I do not really agree with Richard is um, uh, maybe maybe I should put it this way. I I, I agree with him that there's a lot of uh, PFP or JPEGs that are in the space right now who are here for uh, maybe some rug pull or some form of scams and so forth. It it is it is a pain in the ass and it, it is cheating a lot of people's money. You know not only us as a crypto native, you know, also all these uh, new people, you know, whom, 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 who, who think that, you know, it's easy money, right? So, so all, all these PFP guys, all those profile picture guys, I think, I think we, we, have to, we have to really educate people that, you know, some of these things, you just buy it because it looks nice and, and do not really take this as a gamble or, or, or maybe you want to speculate. Or you listen to your friends saying that oh it's going to be a hundred x next the next day. All, all these things we, we got to educate, and then we have to tell them that 
there's a lot of hard work, you know, in order for a profile picture to be to be a half a mil or, or, or 500,000 worth, you know. So we, we really need the education part. But I do not I give, I give you a funny joke. I'll tell you a funny yeah. joke. If you NF, if the NFT guys want to clap back at the uh, crypto guys, just tell them, hey, Bitcoin dropped 72%, Ethereum dropped 83%, and Hex dropped 93%. So, uh, you know, maybe the monkey picture didn't even drop that much. I don't know. It's hard to tell. It, oh, no, but but that but but that goes on to another joke. I I, I one of my friend went for uh, I, I call it a scamina. So so th those guys went to a uh, offline uh, scamina talking about uh, you know uh, investing in uh, crypto and uh, NFTs. You know they they were saying that <clears throat> since uh, Bitcoin has dropped that much, you know there's a very high chance that it's going to bounce back the next month. You know and then. The kind of uh, APY that they are giving them as an example is so huge that I, 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 when I saw the PowerPoint slides, I really think that it is so naive. But, but the, the sad part is there are people who really put in the money right, right on, on the spot, you know, to those guys. So, so those are real upright scams, really doing a lot of scammy work. Uh, but, but I saw their contract, you know, the offline contract, it is very much foolproof because whatever that they are paying, they actually get a certain goods in return, which is the shitty NFT, right? So, so that that's another story. But I, I, I want to talk to Richard about this. Um, you know, when you talk about the multiple chain and so forth, you can just replicate that. But, but if you are holding on to a maybe a punk, for example, right? I agree with you about the copyrights and so forth and so on. But, but having it copied on another chain, on another string of uh, data or another string of hash that's being tagged to it. It, it, it does not mean that they are the original one, right? So, so well, it might not even be. That... I mean, like, so this in the in the event, so the scammy stuff that is really full counterparty risk, where some guy controls a server and you beg him to like not change the JPEG. <laughs> if they support the new chain, cool, you got stuff for free on a new chain. If they don't support the new chain, you don't. The real ones, like the IPFS ones, that are more mm -hmm. trustless. If the data on the chain is what mattered and the chain state was literally bit for bit copied, then, you know, now the question is an issue of liquidity. It's an issue of yep. what is the market for an, ex you know, like, and we, we've seen this before, like, we've seen forks that didn't go well. We've seen forks that did go well. Um, it, it's really a function of, like, I think if, if people are tired of getting ripped off by Ethereum, if, if Ethereum fees go really high, I think that the ones on the alternate chain would be more valuable. But if Ethereum is very cheap, they might not they might not be as valuable, you know? And there's a lot of middlemen. They like like for instance, compound, right? Like who runs their servers? Is there gonna be a compound pointed to the contracts on Pulse Chain? I don't know that they're building that out, right? Like there's a lot of there's a lot of fake DeFi where you have to beg someone to do something or else the stuff doesn't work anymore. You, can, yeah, you can't copy paste the community. So to play to play devil's advocate though. Um and again, I, I'm more about the alternative applications. That's like what actually gets me excited and the gaming aspect of it as well. So like actually Counter-Strike skins, even though this sounds like pretty stupid, like that, that's the type of stuff I'm interested in. But don't people buy expensive art to collect? Like that, that's, the, that, that's the alternative side that I want to actually bring to the table here. Yeah, so, so Richard, like you, you've, you've, you know, a few, a few years ago, you started buying a lot of luxury clothes and stuff, changed your whole style because of the benefits of signaling and, and, you know, signaling has benefits as well as downsides. So the same can, you know, you can have the same thing in the virtual world, even though that, that application- He's, re he's, re he's reconnecting, hold up, he's reconnecting. Richard, did you care? Sure, people oh, people buy expensive art, but it's a lot harder to replicate it because you can't go back in time. So like if a guy made art and then died, he can't go make more art. It's very hard to replicate it. But like when you have procedurally generated, pixelated, low resolution art, that's only stored digitally and people can literally copy paste it. That's like maximum the opposite of like physical painting. Go try and find someone that can actually paint you a copy of it. It's like, it's a lot harder, you know? No, but it's easier to check if something was, you know, if something's original on the blockchain rather than having a piece of art and having to take it to an expert that has to review it and see if it's a legitimate one. And there's been, there's been stories of even, uh, you know, experts that are meant to look at whether art is legitimate or not made errors um, where the blockchain, it's, it's much easier to check something's legitimate. Now, if you're looking at whether a blockchain exists a decade from now, ETH is ETH from a decade from now, and the risk that poses and you can create it on ETH, 
that's a different discussion. But theoretically, it has the same benefits as physical collectibles, physical flexing in the physical world. Would you agree? No, people. There's a there's certain there's a certain qualia of experience in the physical world that you just can't replicate digitally. It's just, you know, you've got two eyes, and your eyes can actually see uh, depth, right? But we try and replicate that with 3D technology and televisions, and it failed terribly. They tried to shove 3D down your throat for 10 years. They gave up. So now if you go to buy television, it doesn't even support 3D because it sucked so bad. And so that's one example of the real world just always beating the, uh, the virtual world. And, you know, another example is smell, temperature, touch. So things that you can, like, physically interact with, and when you move your head around, they change. It's... Uh, it's a lot different, and to tell you the truth, it's better. So I'm going to open something up in the real world. I haven't decided yet. Something outrageous, because I've, I've done the digital thing pretty hard for, for a while now. I want to quickly intro... Jack, hold on. I want to quickly Jack intro two more speakers. Uh, I want to intro Irina, who's a crypto lawyer. Irina, are you with us? Yes, hi, guys. I am with you, and I'm really enjoying this argument. Um, Richard is absolutely fantastic. There's so much I don't agree with him, and there's so much I agree with him. So, you know, wonderful having you, Richard, here. I'm definitely adding spice to the conversation, and uh, I agree with Ryan. Let's keep the swearing a little bit down because we've got communities from all over the world listening, and to a US community, it might be okay, but I'm from the Middle East, and we don't like uh, swearing. It's really, you know, Haram. 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 Make sure, make sure, make sure you mute your mic, KK, when you're not speaking because you For sure. Echoes. For sure. So, you want to do Jack as well? Irina, we have some questions for you with regards to just regulation and what's happening in DeFi for a little bit after, uh, especially with Celsius. You have a couple of tweets that basically spoke about. Um, it, Actually, do you? I think I've mixed you up with another speaker, but I'd love to get your thoughts on that 100%. Now we're currently, <laughs> now we're currently discussing, this is the NFT hour, yeah, so I we're know. basically discussing yeah. the application of NFTs and whether it's just uh, a bunch the of great, super expensive monkeys. Yeah, the great thing being a lawyer, I have an opinion on everything, including things I don't know much about, you know, that's <laughs> being a lawyer for you, so I'll give you an opinion on absolutely everything. So yeah, glad to be here. Thank you so much for having me. 100 percent perfect and then next up we also have jason falovich now for those unaware jason actually used to run at nft so the actual handle on uh, instagram and a bunch of other social media profiles as well jason i'd, I'd love to get your ask your, your your idea with regards to everything that was mentioned right now just with regards to everything that richard mentioned and your take on nfts as well uh considering how prominent you are in the space sure yeah actually um I founded the brand at MT with Mark Cuban, um, just for some clarity, um, uh, at MT on every platform. And the question, I actually just came on, so if you want to restate yeah, yeah, that question, because I, I didn't hear it. Yeah. <laughs> What's up, Ryan? Well, Jesse, What's up, a lot of my boys up, up here. Good to be, I'll let, I'll let you listen in just so, so you know what we're discussing, but I see Jack's got his hand up, and I want to introduce Jack as well. Uh, Jack, you're, you know, you've been early investing in a lot of companies, ex-Google, and the founder of Image Shack. I'd love you, you know, you've got your hand up, so I'd love you to take the mic. Hey guys, uh, very good to meet you. Uh, basically, um, I am an early Googler, employee number 21, started uh, at Google in 1999, quit Google in 05. Been in the image space, been in the crypto space from uh, basically way early. Uh, Mine Bitcoin when it was $3. I think I actually sold Bitcoin to Richard at 30 so uh, thanks, Richard. Uh, and Richard, totally agree with you on uh, the NFT question when it comes to images and how images could be replaced. One thing that we haven't really talked about is the fact that the NFT itself uh, being on chain can be used for the purposes of the gamification and what I would call a human API to the blockchain. So specifically for scorekeeping, a lot of NFT projects by themselves don't mean much if you're just selling and trading the pictures themselves. However, a lot of interesting NFT projects have roadmaps that can create uh, all kinds of interesting storylines. Basically, you can fuse NFTs together, you can advance levels, you can mint uh, more ARC tokens, I mean, ARC20 tokens by holding NFTs, 
then use those tokens to basically advance across the leaderboard, so on and so forth. So the way that I see the NFT space is actually uh, a gamification layer that is on-chain and can keep the score uh, kind of like an undisputable representation of what your level is across the NFT roadmap. And pictures themselves don't mean much. They're just symbols how people can advance across the, uh, across the storyline. And that's what's really, really, really interesting to me is because this is the first time it's not really about pumping and dumping of some sort of ARC-20 token, but rather participating in a sort of a storyline that uh, creative teams can, can imagine. So that's kind of like what we haven't talked about, but I, I see a lot of interesting projects out there that actually have the storylines that people can follow. So. But it's all fun and games until your blockchain fills up. And then you're like, God, I wish we were centralized so we didn't have to pay $50 to mint something. Yeah, but that's a separate question. Like, for example, uh, I mean, blockchain is a new technology. Solana can go down. Uh, fees can go up and so on and so forth. It's all it's all the cost of, uh, of playing, like, so to speak. Actually, I, I like, feel like when... I like how you said Solana can go down, but you meant to say Solana's price could go down. <laughs> I think I think everything can go down price wise and technology wise. But speaking of, uh, let, let's imagine the perfect world where you know blockchain actually stays on and uh, it's proof of stake. We don't pay a lot of fees. At the at the end, one of the uh, interesting ways to start on blockchain for uh, the regular normies, I would say, is to basically participate in uh, play to earn and NFT roadmaps is basically what it is, it's play to earn. Again, you know, you can start on level one, you can collect some NFTs, then based on certain action within that gamified universe, you can fuse them together, end up with some sort of level two, level three, and eventually get to level 10, that is a representation of your effort of, uh, it could be your collection effort, could be some sort of an action, but anyway, so the way I call it is a human API in the blockchain where, you know, those humans that play, they don't really understand what they're doing, but, but yet they have the full ownership of their storyline. So guys, just quickly, okay, okay, I was just muted. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. I think Ryan, uh, Ryan has his hand up. Yeah, I'm going to give the mic to Ryan and, and Evan as well. Um, Evan Var. Um, but before I do, I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to be bringing people on and off the stage just because we've got the Solana creator of Solana NFTs. He works at Solana Labs. He's going to be coming in as a speaker as well. It'll be good to get his perspective. So as we bring him up, we're going to be cycling through the um, panelists as well because we have a limit on Twitter. So uh, Romy told me to inform everyone. But yeah, Ryan and uh, Evanvar, please uh, unmute whenever you like. Hello, hello. Um, there's some interesting tech that I, I think it's important for people to know about. Um, when it, when we think about long term storage, you know, and the cost of the blockchain, and and I agree, it's very important to think about where these assets are actually stored, and are they controlled by an entity that can change that? Um, one technology that I'm particularly interested in, and I don't have any financial stake in it, is Arweave. So Arweave is is a fascinating solution to storing assets for, for long term. So for instance, you know, a, a typical um, 10,000 K PFP collection, which I, I want to remind everybody is, is not, uh, is not what NFTs are. Like that's just a very, very, very small subset of what they are, could be. But if they want to store all 10,000 of those, they typically are about seven K uh, kilobytes each. It would, for 200 years of storage, it's 23 cents for the project to do that. So I think there's an answer now, which is good. You know, folks can use a uh, technology like Arweave, uh, which has built sustainable long-term foundations uh, to fund future storage. And for 23 cents, a project could, you know, protect those assets for 200 years. Um, so it's just... As we have these conversations, I, I think it's important that people know about those technologies and they do exist. Does that solve all the problems? No, um, but it is, uh, it's, it's good to understand that. I don't know. I feel free to unmute, man. Totally agree, Ryan. Um, hey, Mario. So, yeah, I mean, on a high level, we need to also, you know, keep in mind that there's an entire generation currently that's being trained on, you know, around blockchain technology. 
uh, the 15 year olds, the 18 year olds right now, uh, the new generation that's growing up playing Roblox, right? And all these other games. I grew up playing World of Warcraft and Call of Duty and Counter Strike. And if you, if we realize how far we've come so far with blockchain technology within just technically around 10 years or so, it's this mind blowing. It's the fastest growing technology if you think about it, right? And my take is that. Um, Richard, I, I agree with some of the things that you've mentioned, but then, you know, if you take a step back and realize how early we are and that currently these solutions are currently being built by builders, right? By us being so early in the space and using our brain on figure out solutions. This is, you know, th this is something that excites me on a personal level because of course blockchain is not perfect. What is though, right? And when it comes down to, you know, someone shared an example earlier, like sharing your Counter-Strike or Call of Duty skin, of course, that's going to happen. That's what everyone expects in the gaming community to happen, or the majority, not everyone, right? But you have to take a step back and realize, the pr if, you, if you kind of realize the progress that we've had this past couple of years with NFTs and the, op the doors that are currently being opened to builders and brands and individuals and communities, this is the exciting part. It's not just trading JPEGs, but... The fact that people are trading moonbirds and bored apes and, you know, like clones, that's something that basically requires validation and blockchain offers that. Before blockchain, that wasn't possible on a digital level, right? But now it's the beginning of how things are going to take shape within the next 5, 10, 20 years. And we're so early. So I agree it's not perfect. But on the other hand, I don't see like generated art or NFTs in general going away I think that the more people use blockchain technology, generated art is going to be like a smaller and a smaller and art in general and JPEGs is going to be a smaller percentage, but that's going to keep growing. And especially once we see more, you know, elements and assets coming in um, from the tech side, such as music and SBTs and, you know, titles later on and pretty much everything around it, right? Yeah, so we've got. Um, by the way, so hold up, just to uh, just to uh, just to understand ahead. what Evan is saying. Evan, you're saying that the the speculation aspect of it is bound to decrease in the upcoming years, and the utility aspect of NFTs is bound to go up. Is that your point? Because you cut out towards the end. Yeah, sorry about that. Yes, absolutely. I'm going to give you one quick example. You have to also understand that there be, there there are new economies being built. The right? sorry to cut you off, but I just want to add one more thing uh, towards your, your your points. Richard is saying that the technology is flawed, so like I, I can't debate no, that. He didn't he didn't he didn't say that. He said that the applications of technology now are flawed, but the technology itself has a lot of utilities, and we agreed on some of those utilities. You know, digital identity, digital medical records. We're invested in both companies doing both of these things. Right. Those are applications that make sense. Just the PFP aspect, Richard had um, valid concerns with. So I okay, think so I think art's great. I think difference? PFPs are great. Just don't ever pay for them. You know, it's like it's fine. It's fun, but just you don't pay ever for pay. watch though. You pay for watch though, right? No, he, IRL. He's not, he means don't. I mean, so if you believe in the money. if you believe in the Lindy effect, well, the I longer mean, thing the has been part. around. Yeah, but like try and go try and go make a watch and see like so like I've got nine million dollars of Rolexes, but I can tell you that it would be very hard for me to go start my own Rolex company, if not impossible. It would take me probably eight years to like try and ever get to their spec, but I could get to make an NFT like next week. Yeah, but I can also create a website next week, but it won't be Amazon. So I think exactly. the ease of creating NFTs, the ease of creating NFTs doesn't diminish their value, just makes it easier to scam people with NFTs. Um, at least that's my take of it. But I, you know, so, so I agree with, go ahead. No, just, I just want to add one more point, right? Like the, the economies and the ecosystem side of things, right? Like I, when I bought my clone and then Nike, uh, Nike around February airdropped me $20,000 worth of uh, NFTs with the, with the monolith for all the NFT enthusiasts that are here today. Um, that's, that was like something new and that's going to keep growing because we, we, we enter a phase right now uh, with blockchain tech and NFTs in which you don't just buy, for instance, a Burberry t-shirt for $1,000 and that's pretty much it. You throw it away after a few th years. You basically buy a digital asset that re basically retains its value for as long as demand and supply makes sense. And then at the same time, those brands, those big players in the space that are coming in right now, reward you for your loyalty, reward you for being part of the community and for supporting that brand. So, you know, that's just a small, small segment of NFT tech in general. Right. But if you consider that and how this is going to change the game across multiple markets, 
that itself is astonishing, right? So you can't just say that NFTs are like, are not going to make it because of the technology. Of course, the technology is not perfect. But do you realize how early we are? It's like saying like back in 1925 that cars are not going to make it because too many people die, you know, from, from car crashes. We're in the, we're the beginning. I actually tweeted that today, Evan. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, we're in the beginning of the bottom of the first inning of NFTs, in my opinion. Um so go on. I just want to jump in because I do fully, 100% unequivocally agree with you there. I, 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 I do, yeah. So, so Mario, um, I need to go to a meeting. Uh, and so I've got to, I've got to bounce. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I'm getting accused right now of, of not defending NFTs and, uh, and, you know, sort of choking during this argument. And, and the truth is I'm not going to get baited into an argument uh, by somebody who's, you know, uh, uses crass arguments and is a zealot. So that's just where I stand. I don't think it's professional. I don't think it's good for the space. And I've got better things to do. So take care, uh, everybody. I, uh, I appreciate it, Ryan. Thanks for, for being here, man. I, 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 wanna, I agree with him. Wanna, the, the refuge of the person that lost the argument is ad hominems. Uh, so, so but the, the funny part so, is he's so, doing so, the ad hominems. No, no, so, so I want to agree with like, we we... So Ryan's point that he's made throughout the argument, for anyone listening as well, is uh, you know not defending NFTs, I don't think was the case. I think we all concluded that NFTs have utility. There's flaws in the current model. I think Richard pointed out to the pricing and the valuation and people getting dumped on being one of the main flaws, which is you know understandable so early in the technology. We understand there's a lot of applications. We all agree on the applications of NFTs. We also agree that we're far from, from, from perfection. Now, obviously, Richard's way of making the points was a bit crass in the beginning. And, um, and uh, you know, it's tough. Even I was caught with, you know, I, I didn't know how to handle it initially. <laughs> so I don't blame Brian for, for being caught off guard. And I think, Richard, you agree with me that you could uh, come in pretty pretty abrupt at times. So, Mario, what did I miss here, you know? <laughs> I don't know. I just, I, I'm listening. I, I'm, I'm trying to be respectful here, but like, you know, we're not talking about, you know, IPFS and on chain, and we're definitely not talking about on chain correctly when it comes to NFCs. So it's just doing a disservice to the technology at hand. So. But now's your yeah, chance yeah, to educate, bro. Like you're on the call. Like just if something's not being presented yeah, accurately, here, fix it. Richard, I'm li Richard, but I'm listening to you, and I'm just listening to you the entire time. I'm just trying to gauge why you have this hatred towards. Yeah, fuck JPEGs. Okay, fine. You want to go ahead and throw JPEGs to the to the corner, but let's talk about what NFTs are going to do. Like, uh, let's take Alpha Romeo for example, embedding NFTs into all their 2023 uh, vehicles how that's going to change the game completely. Like we haven't touched on that. And we're just talking about, you know, the 10, I'm, I'm ready to touch on that. Please tell me more about hold that. On, hold on, I'm, I'm not finished. I mean, like you cut, you're cutting me off. I, I didn't cut you off. I said, please tell me more. That's the opposite of cutting you off. I want so, you to talk on. more. You are cutting me off, but it's okay. Rich. Yeah. It's, you we'll talk more. Okay. Oh, it's go, okay. Go. I, I get it. Go ahead. You, know, you want to sell now, I'll, but I'll at the end of the day, like, Let's talk about on-chain. Let's talk about the embedment of... Uh, we'll use the example of Alpha, uh, Alpha Romero going ahead and putting it into their vehicles, which will allow the vehicles to go ahead and appreciate. We'll have service records that are on point, unlike Carfax, which, you know, if you use Carfax, you can go ahead and, you know, do shit to where you can erase things that have happened on Carfax, and that's been stated on multiple platforms. Multiple news companies have reported on that. And you're just touching on the 10,000 PFPs that are made on Fiverr and sold and most likely go dead. But like, let's talk about, I'm willing to go ahead and talk to you about on-chain NFTs. We can touch upon on-chain monkeys that literally came out with the first, I would say the first that I ever heard of, the first on-chain product uh, out of all the garbage that has been put out here into the NFT space. Ooh. I you just, I just feel like it. everybody on, is dude, making on, money dude, on the pictures, no, but no. then saying like, it's all about the tech bro. And then dumping on everybody's heads. Like, but hold on. like nobody's yeah, so using who, it though. But Richard, who puts value on things? Uh, uh, I guess like uh, you, the market. <laughs> Yeah, so you put value on the like you wear all these expensive clothes, right? So you you feel that 
those Gucci suits cost ten thousand, forty thousand, fifty thousand dollars, correct? Yeah, like uh, usually ten, I guess, like five to ten, sure. Okay, so you say like that. I show you in that green outfit that co I don't know how much it costs. I'm just gonna give an, uh, a round number of twenty thousand dollars out there. Some people feel like JF here has that golden ape. He feels like, hey, it's worth two point six million dollars, and so do twenty thousand uh, other people. Uh, they see it and they say, I think yeah, it's worth it more. But, you know, it's not the argument here. I think it's worth it, more. It, it, here's what I don't <laughs> yeah. understand. Here's what I don't understand. David. You're, you're, you're trying to have your cake and eat it too. You're trying no, to have your so cake. What I'm saying to you is, you're trying to tell us that it's it all should be free. It's all overpriced. But ultimately, the people put value on shit. I think Yeezys are overpriced. I think half the stuff that you wear is overpriced. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be forty thousand, fifty thousand dollars. Like, what makes it that price? I see. I agree. So, Richard, would you say punks? Let's say crypto punks. Are they overpriced right now? At a minimum price of eighty thousand dollars for one of those. Yeah. Punks, yes. Richard? Yes. I think they are. So, like, why? So, I'm gonna explain it. Uh, if my okay. friend can stop revving the engine a little bit, bro. So, like, the. Uh, we're on a Lamborghini ride. Um, so basically, like, we've got three issues here, okay? Issue Did you one. you say you're on a Lamborghini is, ride, Richard? Or? Yeah, yeah, I'm on a oh, Lambo. That's, so, like, that's, very, that's very humble. I'm sure. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's funny. He's got it in quiet mode. So, like, <laughs> issue one is counterparty risk. Everybody loses with counterparty risk. So if every NFT project could switch to IPFS instead of the counterparty risk stuff, that'd be better for everybody. So that's progress that we can all agree on, right? We don't want people getting ripped off. There's no reason for people to get exit scammed or hacked or whatever. And you reduce attack surface when you use IPFS instead of centralized servers. So I think we can all agree on that. And that's just a huge win for the call. The second issue is price. And I know you guys care about price because you had a, a segment earlier in the show where you talked about the Bitcoin price. Richard, it's not true. It's not true. You know what, what? I care about? When I, I have this board ape, do you know why I have the board ape? It's because I can go ahead and network with people that potentially maybe i can't even reach and you know what the board ape events allow me to go ahead and get into these events and talk about the things that i want to go ahead and do and maybe just maybe i can go ahead and level up my company to the next level that's why i have a board ape not be and you know what the price if it costs uh, 150 eth it was well worth it because i've doubled that by being able to network at these events take ape fest when ape fest was at nft nyc well, you can only get into Ape Fest if you had a mutant or board ape, and here you go. You get in. You know, some people obviously went there to see Eminem and Snoop Dogg rock the mic. That's great. Others went there to go ahead and network and maybe potentially meet Guy. Guy who I think is, you know, as a project manager, phenomenal. How would you be able to meet Guy? You wouldn't be able to meet him without a board ape or a mutant ape, but if you had one, you got to meet him one and got to go ahead and pick his brain for five minutes. That in itself, that five minutes can possibly change somebody else's life. It's the same thing with Gary yeah, so, Z does to be uh, friends. So, Richard, I wanted to make that same point, Richard. Like, um, and another point is always the signaling. So I have a CryptoPunk as a profile picture, the same way you have beautiful Gucci clothes. Uh, and to be honest, you know, I started wearing branded clothes a few weeks ago, even though I hated the concept. I used to look for homeless every day. Just because signaling did have an impact. Someone convinced me, Mario, when you're in meetings, it does actually play a role. So I have a CryptoPunk photo for that purpose. Why else do I have it? Why else do I have a verified CryptoPunk photo? I don't think it looks nice. I think it looks goofy. I don't like the thing on his head. But I have it just to signal to people like, hey, I ha I, no, I'm not bullshitting. I did make some money and I believe in crypto. That's another signal. It's not just money. Do you believe that's not worth? So if you don't think that's worth 80K, and I don't want to, I don't want to seem confrontational. Just really explore what, what how you're thinking. I'm, I'm, I'm like the Why world's grand champion of overpaying for shit for flex value. I got nine million in watches, three million in cars, the world's largest diamond, which I paid four point two million for. I'm the fucking grand champion of overpaying for shit for flex value. But I like my shit to go I'm up. Not gonna lie, Richard. I'd rather buy a four point two million dollar gold ape than a four point two million dollar diamond. And maybe one hundred percent. Maybe one hundred percent. I I generally get way more. Value. Yeah, but like I got I, I got like a hundred articles in the mainstream press out of that. Like it's, it was it, worse. I mean. So, I Richard, you just made my point. So, like, you just, you went ahead. Yeah, and because I agree with that point. Got... Yeah, I'm making your point because I agree with it. Like, yes, flexing so retarded it, shit does get pressed. I actually turned down $4.5 million for my gold ape. That's how much value I put in it. Because this is my digital footprint. This is my digital profile. What the fuck am I going to do with a diamond other than say I own that diamond? 
First of all, I'm gonna say this: human, you own a board ape. Plus. You don't need. You don't. If you have a board ape or you have a crypto punk, you don't need a blue check mark, especially in Web three anymore. Like you have one of these things in your PFPs and you've verified it, you don't need the blue check mark. It's worthless. That's Web two shit. Web three shit. You got the tier uh, top tier NFTs. You are now in the game. You are now able to access all the big time players from Web two who are translating over here into web three into out are there crypto kitty guys in this did the crypto kitty guys get back up or did they stay down or like are they flexing like the ape guys or i don't know i don't know the prices on the, those no I but was, it's not I even would, that i would say crypto Go yes, ahead. i would say crypto kitties though are different because you know crypto kitties are not limited to a certain number of pfps so they weren't designed that's how the price went down so that, it's a fundamentally different tech to to punks and apes because you can't have more than ten thousand punks well, By the way, aren't you able to? Aren't you able to just copy someone else's NFT, get the hex up on Twitter, and that's it? You just want a crypto punk, and you don't need the blue verification. That's called fraud. But it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't exist on the blockchain if you do that. Like it is, yeah, yeah, the original doesn't exist. Twitter, your Twitter can't verify that it's original, and then you know it does the opposite. It yeah, but can they? Can they? Can they? Can they? Can somebody like legally enforce this? Seriously, like out of curiosity. Legally enforcing using someone else's punk, or it, can I ask you guys an actual question? You using it, somebody else's yeah, you can punk because the profile picture. That. You can. Yeah. So, you, so the the most popular uh, NFT is the ape stuff, right? I think. Yeah, apes yes. and punks. New words are is, do they stuff. use IPFS or is it all just counterparty risk? Edward, do you want to take that one? You've got your hand up. Well, I didn't want to take that one, but I wanted to come in and first of all say hello and. <laughs> How's everybody doing? I'm Eddie. I work with Solana Labs and, you know, the top uh, 20 or so NFT projects. I come from DeFi and I love everything, all of this. I don't have a particular stance on either side, but I wanted to have a conversation with Richard because, like, everyone keeps arguing with him and just, like, defending their bags. I actually want to talk to him about the application of some of the tech that these NFTs have and the stuff that I've actually been building and the stuff that's, that's working and that's there. So what's up, Richard? Um, congratulations on Hex. I've just Thanks, man. It's been referenced yeah, by the way, in a ton I mean, of my I'll give you the efforts. mic. <laughs> I just actually, uh, Richard, I want to ask you a question just very quickly. Yeah, so CryptoPunks was not unchained, um, so I'll answer that question before we move on. Wasn't unchained initially, but now is unchained, so they're on the Ethereum blockchain and apes as well. But yeah, go ahead, Edward. Sorry to interrupt, man. No, you're good, brother. How's everyone doing? Good morning. Good morning. Good, good man. morning. Thanks What's for being up, here, dude? So, I mean, I just wanted to talk about just some of the things that, that I've been personally working on with, with my bare hands, with NFTs, and how I think that it benefits everyone in here. So, I, I was a little taken back and confused with your lack of support for NFTs, given how big you are in the space. And that's fine. You know what I mean? It's cool. Maybe you don't know about some of this shit that's going on. So, I just want to tell you about it and, you know, give me your opinion on it. Um, there's a lot of people that are in this space where NFTs came second. We're all, a lot of us are DeFi guys. Bitcoin guys, Bitcoin maxis, and I support all of that. I think Bitcoin's the future. I think it's fucking awesome. And I think NFTs kind of came second, right? But now what's happening with Solana and the amount of active wallets is that NFTs are becoming a point of entry where like my aunt or uncle, um, just I just tested this with them. We released this tech at, at NFT NYC. We have something called Cupcake. All your cell phones have all, NFC readers inside them, right? So imagine going up to something, tapping on the sticker, whether it's a painting, a skateboard, a concert ticket, a vinyl record, whatever it is. And within 30 seconds and two clicks, you have a custodial wallet that your cell phone number owns and an NFT in that wallet without having a fiat on ramp, without having to convert a whole bunch of tokens to USDT, USDC, understanding that nonsense, waiting for seven days for Coinbase to say you can have your money <clears throat> and all that shit. So I think it's like really special to have some things like this as a point of entry. Like, how are they going to buy Hex if they're afraid of crypto, but they're willing to tap their phone on something and have a decent experience and, you know, come in that way. So that's like I, one I way agree with on ramps, bro. Yeah. I, I think on ramps are great. I just yeah. so from the on ramp perspective, I just want to see people take minimal. So like the networking angle is great. I just wish it cost less. The on-ramps yeah. is great. I just hope that they're low fees. Like, you guys got to remember, crypto was invented to get rid of middlemen and increase efficiency. And so, like, I see tokens that perform taxing on a, on a transfer, and that's literally maximum fee instead of minimum fee. And that's the opposite of why crypto is invented. Or I see counterparty risk. It's the opposite of why crypto is invented. So things that help on-ramp users, hopefully with minimal risk, things that don't have admin keys, things that don't have counterparty risk. You know, I like a lot of this stuff. So, and look... You know, I got in at uh, Bitcoin mining at 50 cents. 
bought it at 30, dumped right down to two, held it down 93%. You know, so my first experience with Bitcoin was the bubble, but it worked out in the end, right? So like, even though I got in through a, a kind of sucky way, uh, it, you know, it worked out in the end. So I like, I like some of these points you guys are making. I, I got a question, Richard, about your diamonds. I think it's pretty cool you own that. You know, no, no disrespect at all. Um, so with the transparency of NFTs and everything on the blockchain, like I, I know what my gold apes are worth based on rarity and such. How do you know you actually own the largest diamond in the world? Like, you know, there could be someone that just doesn't give a fuck to, to you know, flaunt that or, or they'll want the clout that's sitting with a diamond. Yeah, it's true. There, there could be a bigger one somewhere else for sure. And you know what? You guys are going to be able to help verify more because I'm going to make an NFT out of that shit. Even though I tell people, look, uh, don't overpay. If I if they won't take my advice, I'm going to offer you the world's biggest diamond NFT. I think I'll have 5,555 copies because 10,000 worked out for the apes, guys. I think that's their, uh, their supply. You know, like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to jump in the game, but uh, I don't know. Yeah, well, Richard, it's I mean, all right. So what's, sure you know so what's the tenth not... asset? I just want to make sure you know, Richard. Sorry about that, David. I just want to make sure you know that it's not all just like a freaking big nonsensical thing. Like I've literally met tens of thousands of people like in real life. I met with Gucci yesterday. Like we're talking about authenticating their fucking merchandise using some of this tech. So I mean, I just want you to kind of have an open. Bro, I buy. Hey, bro, I buy Prada shit. Change. Hey, listen, for real, listen. I buy so much money in Prada shit. It's retarded. And some of my items come with a blockchain certificate that I don't know how the fuck it works, but apparently I can go look up the My Shit's Authentic on a blockchain somehow. And everything I buy comes with some RFID shit too that apparently somehow I can verify My Shit's Authentic. But here's the funny part. I don't know how to fucking do it, and I'm not sure it can even be done to tell the truth. Because they, they advertise it, they hype it, but then when you go to like actually check it, it's just like a blockchain. Some guy was telling me, hey, man, you know, I'm running my own node. I'm so hardcore. You know, it's going to take 33 hours to download it. And I fuck with it. I'm like, hey, I'm sorry for the cursing. Um, I tell him, listen, man, how do you know you didn't download a fake client? And he goes, oh, I verified the SHA-256 and the PGP. First, I know you didn't. You lying. Okay. But second, how do you know that those two numbers you're verifying against ain't fake? And he eventually has to get it into his head that it's all social verification. That's how you know anything is real, is from the social aspect. Because, like, you could be talking to a parallel Eclipse network. You could be talking to, you know, scamware. Like, like who, who here actually compiled their own client? How do you know whatever wallet you're using doesn't just send a copy to the devs of your keys? You don't. Nobody in here is, comp like, complying with their own wallet. It's not happening, you know? Who, who's uh, generating their seed words in a Tempest cage to prevent, uh, you know, of your seeds through EMP radi uh, EMF radiation? You know, nobody is like we're all we're all taking some shortcuts, reasonable shortcuts, I hope, to like have some convenience with this stuff. But in the end, like it, it all comes down to trust, like in, in, a, in an industry built to remove trust. There's still a lot of trust. I, th I think I think you talk a lot about flexing, you know, flexing your diamond, flexing your world class uh, Rolex collection. I mean, listen, it's, it's dope. You're driving a Lambo dope. You know, that that's you need money to do that shit. Cool. I mean. From NFT perspective, I gotta be honest. Like, I can buy fucking any NFT, and, and and yesterday I sold the CryptoPunk, and Bill Murray bought it. You know, that's for me. That's pretty fucking dope. Like, I can't really speak like that outside of chain because I wouldn't probably know what Bill Murray bought of mine or what he's purchasing, right? So, you know, there's an element beyond just this is a piece of you know it's a JPEG for for whatever purpose it is. You know, Bill fucking Murray, one of the you know one of the the legends of the industry came. Of, of the of, of, of entertainment came into our space and bought a crypto punk for me you know there's something to be said that is about cool that. i like it actually, 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 <laughs> you wanna, i know you've got your hand up I'll i hope he makes money on it then david yeah sure i um i actually like i love richard um i listen to him on a few podcasts so but i would be curious if there would be anything that would get you into nfts because you just are so against them and i i'm just curious what would get you your foot in the door for that no, no for real i'm oh, gonna launch a 5555 copy nft version of the world's largest diamond which used to be called the enigma it's since been renamed the hex.com diamond i'm gonna do that i mean it's easy i just have to choose i'm gonna basically i don't know if i want to give away i guess i could give it away because i still have the, the biggest diamond so I'm going to take a, a picture of each of the 55 facets. So this, this world's biggest diamond is 555.55 carats, and it's cut to have 55 facets. And so I'm going to take a picture from every one of the 55 facets to make 
each NFT slightly unique. And then I'm going to customize the backdrop of what they're in front of, license or have created some type of kick-ass media. And I don't know, I don't know whether I'm going to regionalize it because it works so well with rap songs. I'm probably going to make it regional. And so you'll have like your version of a different angle of the diamond, a picture of it, and then regionalized backdrops. And I think that that would be fire. I think I think that that would, as far as NFT stuff goes, I think that would hit pretty hard. Um, but then I hope people don't overpay. But, you know, look, markets, as you guys all said, the market set the price. And people treat this stuff like pseudo gambling. And so the prices can get pretty silly. So what would be the what price that you would open at then? I had never even thought about that, dude. I didn't even know that that was a choice I had to make. I never got oh. that far into the thinking. So you could do a free mint, or you can go ahead and start off at some, uh, you know, some zero point one. I don't know what platform you. Would I think I think a re maybe a reverse auction would work pretty good. I think a reverse auction would be a good idea. But what do you think your what what do you think your NFTs would be worth though? I have literally no idea. I mean, I I've savaged the NFT community a lot, but I'm also trying to save you guys with gas fees with Pulse Chain. So it's hard to say, man. It's like fifty fifty. Half hate. Half like, right. I don't know. You're, you're, you're no, no, but it's like, I if I paid tell, like $10,000 for it, is it overpaying? I can't tell if you're kidding or if you're really going to do this, but either way, this has been entertaining. I just want to throw one more point out there and then you guys can continue to argue about, um, argue with each other. It's, 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 it's just amazing. I don't think but, it's an um, argument. I think it's just a passionate debate. Yeah, I, I, I just don't, I don't know. It's, it's just goofy. I just wanted to share one part that was like fucking fascinating for me about um, NFTs and application because that's what I care about. I, I have to be a megaphone for these devs and these tech nerds that don't know how to, you know, share what their technology is to the real world and, and reach the masses. And I've done this with Lyft, with Postmates. I have a decent track record. But um, I was taking a walk with my uh, favorite Ponzi app, Stepin, and I was earning tokens walking down the street. And uh, I saw this lady who came up to me at the end of the beach, and she was like, yo, are you on your Steppin' walk? And she was like my mom's age, right? And I was like, what? I was like, yeah, I am. I'm like, isn't Solana awesome? And this lady had no clue what Solana was. She had no idea that she was using crypto. She had no idea she was on chain. This woman fiat on-ramp money, converted it in an app, transferred it from wallet to wallet, purchased an NFT, walked with the NFT, earned a DeFi shitcoin, and then transferred that to USDC and got it to her bank. And like, that shit is fascinating to me. So if, if NFTs can help people get on chain without knowing they're on chain, then I'm fucking happy. I don't care who has a bigger diamond or a bigger ape. Like, you guys are all awesome, and, and I'm supportive of everyone up here. But I just think that the mass adoption is closer than we think. There's really cool tech. I literally met with the CEO of Gucci two days ago, and it was fascinating how interested he was in this. So, yes, uh, and, and what is it, Richard? I think a lot of these stuff that are on your Versace suits and shit, a lot of these guys jumped in early and threw RFIDs on their shit and didn't have a clear path of anything. But that's my job to come and fix that and i'm gonna do a damn good job at it i haven't failed it much yet so i just wanted to come up here and share that i see the mass adoption happening i'm really excited about it i love bitcoin maxis i love solana i love eth i love all of it and i think all you guys are great just wanted to come in share my sense and a couple experiences and uh i'm, I'm gonna step back down so you can bring back speakers I, I knew you had me on schedule but just wanted to say hello and give love to all you guys these spaces rock mario so thank you bro i appreciate it thanks a lot man thanks i'm bringing in tony so so richard are you up for a debate i've got a lot of people uh, and, and I'm sure you're going to guess, um, you know, sending me messages about Hex. Do you mind if I bring someone to debate the projects that you're currently did, working did you, on? Did you guys notice that I never mentioned anything about Hex at all? Like, it just does its own thing. I never even yeah. talked about it. You, you, you touched on it, but didn't talk about it. That's true. But are you okay if we bring someone to debate them? Yeah, dude, I love debates. Debates are awesome. Hey, Richard, what's the value oh, of that diamond? The I mean, I paid 4.2 for it. I think I got a really good deal. Um... It's, you know, one of a kind, one in the universe kind of things, space diamond. I don't know, 20, 30 million, probably my guess. But, you know, I think that luxury good purchases get hit really hard when the stock market dumps. So, you know, maybe it'll be a bear market, but I, I bought it so good. I mean, maybe it's only eight now, but there's no way you're going to get that for four. Like, it's going to be impossible. How long would you buy it? I think I bought it like six months ago, maybe. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. I was just curious. Cool. So, I'll, I'll refresh the <laughs> I paid crypto for it, dude. I paid for crypto. Oh, really? All right. Yes, yeah, Sotheby's took crypto for the, the hammer price, which was 3.6 million pounds. And then they wouldn't take uh, crypto for their money because they're scared. Uh, and you had to do a bank wire for that part. All right. I like that. That's cool. Cool. Uh, JF, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refresh the room and introduce Tony to, to get into the debate um, with Richard. 
But everyone that's listening, I think that the, 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 the space, um, the agenda changed pretty quickly, but I appreciate you all being here. We've got 3,200 people listening, which is a, a record. I didn't expect. I mean, I mean, listening. like it's still, it still is like NFT hour. But I mean, like the the agenda, <laughs> the, the agenda that we have like whipped up, like we wanted to discuss wash trading, NFT money laundering, etc. But I, I, I think we 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 covered a couple of pretty valuable. Man, I I'll be honest, I'll, I'll be honest. I've been watching Richard. I've known Richard and not personally, but I've known Richard since I got into crypto, and I've watched some of his videos. And I know he's, he's very polarizing. And I knew that if I bring Richard, I'm like, I was talking to Bob. I'm like, Bob, how do I moderate the room? Richard's coming. He's like, who's Richard? I'm like, watch this video. I'm like, Bob, how what do I do? He's like, Mario, I don't know. <laughs> You're on your own. So it's, it, it was a tough one, but it turned out really well. But Richard, I appreciate you being here. I appreciate everyone that joined the stage so far. So before we kick off the debate, I just want to tell the audience, thanks for, for, for being here. If you have questions or if you want to participate in the giveaways, we're not giving away a $4.2 million diamond, but we have $10,000 in giveaways. Make sure you click on the link in the pinned tweet and then join all the communities on Telegram, Discord. Uh, we don't shill any projects. We've never shilled a project. I'm not planning to shill any project, not even the ones we're incubating. So um, you can join the groups, participate, ask questions. We're reading all your questions. And we're, we're trying to ask some of them to the panelists here as well. Um, so click on the pin tweet at the top of the space to join. So you have to subscribe to the newsletter, join Discord and Telegram. And make sure you share this space. And of course, if we announce your name as a winner and you're not in the space, as you know, you don't get the prize. So you have to be in the space and be listening when we call out your name. Uh, but Tony, are you here, man? Make sure you have good audio, Tony. Don't fuck it up again, please. I swear, Tony, are you on a Nokia, bro? Like, what the fuck? Oh. How long did it take you to join? Honestly, Twitter is about as efficient as Solana's uptime, so uh, it, it's, it's just a bit uh, laggy on my end. Sorry about that. Yeah, man, your, your, your I don't know if it's connection or your audio. Is it your connection or your mic? Uh, I, I think it's the connection to Twitter. Uh, I keep on clicking join, but it's kept on clicking that, hey, look. I can, you're going look, to I can hear you now. It's all good now. Yeah, okay. it's all good now. All right, man. So, so, so you you wanted to come up on stage to have a chat to Richard about certain questionable things that Richard's doing. And Richard's not an easy person to debate. Um, you know, he's been in this space for a long time and knows what he's talking about. Um, but you've had the courage to come up. I'd love you to take over the mic, man. Ask any questions to Richard, and let's dig into the points that I'm sure a lot of people, including a lot of people at DM me, want us to address. Yeah, for sure. And Richard, it's nice to meet you. Uh, your OG in this space followed a lot of your work. Um, these are less questions about you yourself and more questions about just the Hex token. So nothing about you personally. Um, but yeah, it's nice to meet you, man. Hey, pleasure to meet you, bro. Yeah. So uh, these questions are mostly about Hex. Just before we go into it, I'm just going to give a quick description of Hex. Please do correct me, interrupt me if you feel like I misrepresented in any ways, just to kind of give everyone a bit of a backdrop on what we're speaking about. Uh, are you okay with that? Yeah, everything sounds good. Yeah, so Hex is a token on ERC20 token on Ethereum. Uh, the utility of Hex is that you can stake it and earn rewards in Hex. Uh, once you invest it in some Hex, you can stake it and you can expect to earn a good API on those Hex tokens if you choose to lock it up from anywhere between uh, 10 to 5555 five, five, five days. And after that, you can sell the Hex token for profit. That's what the Hex website states and is also what the token is generally used for. It claims to be a certificate of deposit and it claims to generate an API purely through inflation. Uh, I have nothing said nothing wrong there, correct? I mean, you're breaking up a little bit, but it sounded pretty good. The, the minimum stake length is a day. The maximum is 5,555. Um, I mean, yeah, that was probably one of the better explanations I've heard. Yeah, it's, it sounded pretty good. Okay, so I just want to not misrepresent your token, and I got most of this information from your website. So basically, let's start from the very beginning. The first question is, is does it go through the how you test? Is it a registered security? Because... I went to your website and one large aspect of it is, hey, we're not an actual security, we're a certificate or deposit, which could be argued upon as a part of the security listing. How do you see people that say that you're a security? Oh, it's, well, I'm like the grand champion of explaining this to people. So you asked the right guy. Security laws are made to protect people and per people get scammed all the time. People run away with their money. Like you just saw Celsius uh, file chapter 11 bankruptcy today. Um, I warned everyone. 
told them to, to move, remove their money a year and a half ago, I think. Uh, you know, some people listened, others didn't. Uh, so what do, the, what do the securities laws do to try and protect people? Well, they state that if you give money to a common pool with the expectation of profit solely from the work of others, and there's critical entrepreneurial or managerial effort, then you may have a security. And so these are the legs of the Howey test. And those last two were kind of added on, not case law legs, but just they wrote them. The regulatory agency just wrote them. They're not actually tested in case law um, or they're not from case law, which would be stronger. You know, people don't realize that like just because a regulator says something or writes something, it doesn't mean it's actually so. And that the regulators sometimes win in court and they sometimes lose in court. And what makes things truly so in America is the judicial branch of which the regulators are not. They're in the executive branch. And so case law and jurisprudence is really what decides. I mean, just recently, actually, the SEC hey, got Richard. annihilated. Yeah. yeah. So sorry to interrupt you here. Uh, yeah. But uh, can, uh, I do agree with what you're saying. Some of it is true. Some of it is less so, in my opinion. But this is actually, the Howey test is actually not established by the regulator. Uh, the Howey test is established after R.V. Hari, which is actually American case law. I know that. Yeah. I know that. I agree with that. So I'm telling you that the the first legs of the Howey test are from case law, but those last two that I added with critical entrepreneurial managerial effort are not. Critical. So the first part. Also, critical entrepreneurial effort is no longer considered a big part of it. The Howey test only consists of four parts as of active enforcement, which is. I know that, but I'm adding. Part. I'm adding parts outside Howey, like family likeness test. I'm going above and beyond them. I'm, I'm showing you things that the SEC has said they care about that is outside of case law. I'm being more uh, descriptive than you required. I could, I'll just tell you about Howie if you want, but I'm telling you that you should also care about critical entrepreneurial effort, critical managerial effort, and family likeness test in addition to Howie. So, yeah. so, just, so we'll just talk about Howie, right? Because I guess I went too far. Um, yeah, it, it's easier for it's fine. the yeah, it's like fine. listeners to. Yeah. It's okay. So how he basically is, are you putting your money in a common pool? So let's take Celsius. Did everyone's money go into a common pool? Yes. Okay. Now let's take Hex. You buy Hex. Where's your money go? It goes to someone else. It goes to someone else that had Hex. It doesn't go to some company called Hex. You bought from somebody else. Okay. And now where do your rewards come from? Do you, does someone else give them to you? No, you mine them yourself like a Bitcoin miner. You're the only person in the entire world that can possibly mint your reward. You're the only person that has those private keys that can mint that reward. And so you, through your own computational effort and through your own work, generate your own product, something that never existed before, coins that never existed before. You mint them into existence out of your own labor. So if you look at Howie, it says expectation of proof, expectation of profit solely from the work of others. Okay, well, who are the others doing the work? They ain't no company. It's you. You're doing the work. So since you generate your own rewards, it's, it's the family likeness test would state that Hex is most similar to Bitcoin. The only difference is that we use Ethereum miners instead of Bitcoin miners, and we pay you to uh, lock your coins up instead of blow up the environment with SHA-256 mining. But other than that, it's just Bitcoin, the proof of work change. And so, so there, so it, yeah, so it fails like yeah. almost, it, it feels like all the legs of Howie because there is no central entity. There is no critical managerial effort or work. If I died and hex.com went offline, it wouldn't matter at all, literally. There's 10 other front ends you can use. It, the, the, like, it, it's totally irrelevant. Like me and hex.com, it doesn't matter for the project at all. Um, it, it said it launched sufficiently decentralized as well. We had multiple front ends at launch. You know, we, we have immutable code. So people right now, Bitcoiners attack Ethereum by saying that Ethereum is a security because there's a group of guys that decide things. Hey, and Richard. they decide, yes. Yeah, so this part is pretty understandable. And and I think everyone's pretty much caught up to this point. That's an interesting take on how you guys does not fit the Howie test, which I do respect. Um, I will not actually focus on the hex staking of it. Sure. Right now, hex is offering 40% APY. Where is that APY coming from? Inflation. Okay, so in your site yourself, you claim that inflation is the kind of ultimate deterrent for keeping money in the U.S. dollar because the government is stealing from you. How is inflation 
making new money? And how is inflation here actually increasing the amount of money people get? Well, it's it doesn't. That's that's not where the majority of the gains come from. So Hex's price went up a million percent in under two years. That's 10,000 X. That's before staking. So if you never staked at all and you bought January 5th of 2020 and Did you sure. held to like, yes, that that's not answering the question. My question is, where is that money coming from? Is let's say if I stake a hundred hex and let's assume hex is just like one dollar. Yeah, it comes from the same up. place it comes from in the bank, but you probably don't know how banks work. So I'm going to teach you that in a second too. So, are, are you, so are you guys a fractional reserve bank? I'm pretty sure on your site you specifically said you're not. No, I'm I'm saying that all yield comes from inflation everywhere. The stock market yield comes from inflation of the U.S. dollar. Oh, the yield yes. in your bank uh, uh, comes from inflation from the U.S. dollar. The yield yes. in Bitcoin for the Bitcoin miners comes from inflation of Bitcoin. The yield in HEX comes from inflation of HEX. Okay, like so it's, it's, the yield we're, we're, everywhere globally is from inflation of different things. I think you're using inflation return as two different terms and in terms of using. Oh no no okay so I'll, I'll use the more specific term uh, monetary expansion. But now yeah, no one will understand what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah, but no one will understand what I'm saying now because they don't get that. Like, they don't know the clinical technology like we do, the terminology. So let's talk about that then because how are you actually getting that active return? Because from very... It's, it's more similar to a stock split than it is actual... Okay, people think okay. inflation is bad, but it's actually not. A You're going to love this one. Richard, a stock split doesn't increase the actual value of the stock. It just makes it easy for people to buy a whole stock. My Correct. Question, uh, again, so let's say, let's say you owned all the hex, you owned it all, you, okay, you owned it all, and then you staked it, and you minted yourself some extra hex coins. Now I'm going to ask you, where did your yield come from? Because that's what you're asking me. And it's the the answer is that in reality, you just minted yourself some more of what you already had. And so now that's the exact same example and the exact same solution, but you're just adding more people. It's just Bitcoin uh, mining. Dude. Uh, so more people coming in is the way that you could earn that API. Let's say I earn 20 extra hacks, just need to sell it to a new people for me to get my money. All speculative instruments have the property that they go to zero if everyone sells and no one buys. The real uh, estate, the real estate has the property that if everyone sells it once, it goes to zero. And if new people don't buy, the prices go down. Stocks, if new people don't buy them, the prices go down. Everything, okay. life, all human life dies if you don't keep fucking and, sorry, making new kids. Like, life has this parameter that you need to exceed the entropy. You have to export the entropy or you literally die to heat death of the universe. Like, yeah, And we do I, export I entropy. On, on a massive scale, yes. And uh, when we over-exaggerate everything, yes. But... My question is, is actually right there on the bubble there it is basically the whole thing of, hey, you're, look, you're just, you're, it, you're trying to call it a Ponzi because prices only go up if new people enter. But unfortunately, that is everything. That is all human life. That's the stock market. That's Bitcoin. It's just Bitcoin Richard, with a proof of change, dude. Richard, 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 <laughs> I, I never claimed Ponzi. It, it's clear. It, it's, it's interesting that you said that because I'm trying to ask you exactly what the revenue model is. And you yourself admitted that it's... Well, really there isn't, there isn't a revenue model. It's, it's like the revenue model for a baseball card. It's like, what's oh. the revenue model for a collectible? For sure. It's the same question. Only, it's like... Yeah, so Richard, I, I'm not going to insult intelligence. You know what a commodity is and you know how commodities are priced. How are you a better Bitcoin? When the only the way to less negative your, externalities, and next we have less negative externalities, but and we're more secure. Bitcoin, but the way Bitcoin is actually minted and the way that Bitcoin is actually produced, at negative externality is what it gives us commodity value. Bitcoin no, because we could commodity. swap the proof of work. No, Bitcoin should prop. Bitcoin should swap its proof of work to proof of stake, save the environment, and stop dumping the price every ten minutes. Bitcoin miners okay. buy electricity and pollution and sell the price down. It's disgusting for everybody involved. It's horrible. It's we know we've got... Some... It's also how, how it's prices determined. But this conversation is not about Bitcoin. It's about Hex. Let's go no, but Hex is just Bitcoin with a proof of work change. It's it's literally the most similar thing in the world to it. We just use different miners. Well, we use no, Ethereum miners instead of Bitcoin miners. You have to constant expansion outwards. That's not... That's no, not but look. No, no. Okay. This is what everyone misunderstands. When was the best time to buy Bitcoin? When the inflation rate was the highest. And when, after the fucking happening happened four times, it's, li it's limp now. It can't even make a new all-time high five years later. It's lower now. 
five years later than it was five years ago. It used to be 20K five years ago. Now it's 19K. Why? Because the inflation rate's lower because it's too heavy now. So a, a high inflation rate was amazing for Bitcoin early. It was the best time to buy. Totally centralized ownership when Satoshi owned 100% of coins was the best time to buy. When it was had no liquidity and was listed nowhere was look, the best Richard, time to buy. Yeah, look, Richard, we're not talking about Bitcoin. We're talking about Hex. All those Why? same things I just said hold true for Hex as well. Yes, but Hex is only a speculative instrument as far as no value as a transfer of value, which your site itself claims. Yes, it and does. I, I, it's more secure than Bitcoin. You understand Bitcoin's had two critical vulnerabilities where anyone could print as many free coins as I they know, wanted. Know, Hex I has know, had none. And, and Hex is unlikely to have any because it's more secure. What you keep on saying is more secure, but you're still relying on the Ethereum network. I no, 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 no. It's not true because they don't have the same failure mode. Ethereum is more likely to have an inflation bug than Hex is, even though Hex runs on Ethereum. Because Ethereum's consensus code is closer to the node. It's not isolated in its own smart contract. It's not modular. Bitcoin is more likely to have an inflation bug than Hex because Hex's consensus code cannot be changed. Let's so whether start. they make... Yeah, okay, I think you're talking about security from founders instead of security... No, no. I'm talking about attack surface from bugs. The majority of software, the majority of flaws in Bitcoin and in cryptocurrencies in general are inflation bugs. Monero yes. has had an inflation bug. XLM has had an inflation bug. Ravencoin has had an inflation bug. Bitcoin has had an inflation bug. Richard. There's tons of inflation bugs everywhere. I'm talking to you about computer security. Yeah, okay. Let's let's off the computer, computer security. Let's just talk about economics. The utility of hex is that you can stake it to get more hex. Did, is that statement accurate? Not really, no. Because that okay, activity so on its own, that activity, hacks. it allows you to delay gratification, which is the most successful investing wait, concept wait, wait, that's wait. ever existed in the history of, of and, concepts. Yeah, that's only if you believe Hex itself is going to appreciate in value. But to do that, the only real utility of Hex is to stake it and earn more Hex. It sounds like you're trying to disprove proof of work networks. You understand every proof of ne work uh, network has this property that inflates. All proof of network networks inflate. I'm, I'm talking about a pure utility level. Am I correct in saying that Hex itself, as the utility that most people use it for, is to stake it and then earn more Hex? Actually, only 10% of people stake, which is why the rewards are so high. If oh, more yeah. people stake, the rewards would be cheaper. It's yeah, only got a 3.69% inflation. Yeah, that's actually my next question. Everyone yeah. stake hex in a perfect world. If everyone's investing in hex, everyone stake, hold stake hold hex. There's something only... super important. There's something super important I have to tell you. Not all inflation is the same. If you have no negative externalities and you have no electricity bills to pay and you have no mining companies to pay, then it's just like a stock split. You're just making more tokens for yourself. If you were the only guy that held all the hex and you minted some more tokens for yourself, that inflation literally cost you nothing. You just wrote yourself some extra tokens. The reason that people don't like inflation is because the people that get the inflation usually sell the shit out of it and hurt the price. That's why people don't like inflation is because it gets so, sold. Wait, so Richard, actually, I want to talk to you exactly on that aspect. What happens in five years when most of your stakers are unstaked and get their return? It's a huge fallacy that everyone has. They think that there's some single point in the future where the behavior of the market participant changes. And the reality that we've measured is the exact opposite. When I first started bragging about how long people stake their hex, it was like three years. Then it was four years. Then it was five years. Now the average stake length in hex is 5.8 years. The stake length keeps going up. New so, wallets so, keep wait, opening. Wait, wait, it keeps wait, working so. with 100% flawless operation. So you're dreaming of a world where everyone has to end stake at the same time. But in the reality, the measurable world, everyone just keeps staking for longer. Okay, so wait, wait. I actually want to talk exactly there. Your point is that, hey, look, people are going to keep staking for longer and this is going to keep going. Is that not exactly what Bernie Madoff told to his investors? Mm, I don't know. I never, he never scammed me. I'm not sure exactly how he, uh, I'm not sure what his sales pitch was. I don't think his sales pitch was that, no. I think we're the opposite of Bernie Madoff. So basically, like, your, your, your question is, like, this is similar to, like, you asking, what happens if everyone sells other Bitcoin at once? Or what if no one buys Bitcoin anymore? I, it's I a silly question. I, I, think, I think you're trying to isolate yourself, and this is a great debate tactic that personally I use a lot. 
is you're trying to isolate yourself from the question. Instead of talking about hacks, you're attacking Bitcoin's weak aspects to get aspects of Bitcoin. They're not, but they're not weak aspects. Look, look, I don't, look, look, listen, look. my stake length keeps going up, but you're trying to tell me like it sucks somehow. Like, no, it's perfect. It's what we want. I, I, I'm not saying it sucks. I'm, my question is when it comes to hacks, the utility of hacks is you can stake it to earn more. This is straight from your website. And your website has a literal page to describe exactly how it's going to do so. To but, ask people, say, hey, look, please invest in this. Put your money in this. Put out like 100 in it to try. It is a risky asset. Your website creates all of those things to specifically say that these are going to be risky assets. My it, it's just funny that you focus on the 40% yield when the actual yield was a million percent. I think that's hilarious. Your orders of magnitude focused on the wrong thing, but you don't understand that. Look, the vast majority look, of the gains look, and look, hacks look, are USD price appreciation, about, not staking. Yeah, USD and only 10% of people stake, but you keep talking about staking all the time. It's crazy. Yeah, look, look, we're talking about the staking aspect because when you tell everyone that there's a 40% APY, what, I know after if everyone, 100% people do stake, that's only 3%. That's what No, I'm but the actual about. APY is thousands of times higher, but I'm just afraid to tell I, I them think, the truth because it'll scare them. I think you're also, mis you're also misappropriating because the way you got to that APY, and Richard, I'm just being very honest here, is by other people coming in, believing in exactly what you just said, saying, hey, look, if I lock up my money, it's already did a 20x, it might be tw do 20 more, it might do 20x, it might be 20 more, which no. costs the new investor hey. money coming in. That's in I am, the, I am the number one champion of warning people about volatility in crypto. My website says that crypto drops 85 or 95 percent all the time. My website, this stuff might stop working and go to zero, and you'll be very lucky that it works at all. Like, go, go click the disclaimer on my website, or go click yes, how it I works. I, I, I'm like fine. the I, yeah, like I'm the most truthful guy about how risky blockchains are and how like if you, man, when when Bitcoin.org gets hacked and it has a scam on the front, Satoshi doesn't do a live stream to save Bitcoiners, but I do. Well, you know, I'm the number one out, the guy out there trying to prevent people. From, it's weird that, like, is the guy that created a yield generating product with no counterparty risk, you hold your own keys. That in a, in a reality where everyone just got bankrupted and lost billions and billions and billions of dollars, I'm getting attacked when I literally built the solution. That's crazy look, to look, me. I'm not attacking you, Richard. And my question is very simple because, again, at the end of the day, this is how the calculus works, right? Let's take it on a very micro scale so we can kind of show all the audience, like, it's making it way easier to understand. Let's say you and I, Richard, you and I, uh, both have hex. You're the creator, so you hold currently, I think, 50% uh, of the sacrifice. Uh, let's say you hold 5% of the hex, and I hold another 0.2% of hex. Both of us stake and both of us stick from the same amount of time. We're both expecting us to gain more hex, and the way that we're doing that is by staking. And the way we think that more hex is gonna be valuable is through previous price appreciation. So the way that we're actually gonna have our exit liquidity is coming in from new money, new people investing and believing the same thing we are. How is that not a not, a not fair statement? Like I said, and- No, but like, I don't, I don't understand. So you're more, framing, more you're massive. framing, no, but you're, you're describing a free market, but then framing it as though it is evil. And I don't understand that. Not, so, so yes, the market, market decides. A free market has exchange value. A free market has exchange of value. I'm saying that on this specific asset, what is the, where is that actual value add? And where is that base of value line? Right. Okay. I, 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 okay. Do you care about security? Yes, I do. Yes, you security. do. Yes. Do you understand that Hex is literally more secure than Bitcoin? Literally. I don't think you do. Look, I think you hear me saying the words, but I don't think you look, believe me. I, look, even if I'm taking you at your best and say Bitcoin is less secure somehow, which, to be fair, I'm not a cybersecurity expert. I can't comment on that. I'm saying, saying simply on an economics level, where is that additional money coming from? Let's say that, let's say 100% had to say Less that. negative look, externalities. Look, Bitcoin look, okay. pays like, billions of dollars a year to blow up the environment to murder its own price. Hex does not because we piggyback Ethereum and Ethereum's already eating that horror, so we don't have to. We pay look, pennies for security, what Bitcoin pays billions. It's more efficient. Yeah, look, I'm not comparing you to Bitcoin. I'm trying to ask about Hex on a specific level here. Let's say that every single Hex is state. Let's say every single Hex is state. Okay. And 3.69% 3 inflation happens. Who's going to buy that 3.6%? a information number it's not going to actually mean you're getting more money it's just so, you said it stops there right so you're going to have 3.69 percent uh, more 
And my question is very simple here. Does new investors need to come and buy that 3.69% to generate you that revenue? I muted you, Richard, just because you had background noise, just heads up. So you got to unmute Richard. I'm sorry, my, we, it'll be quieter. So the, it is, the reason that Bitcoin's largest gains were when its inflation rate was the highest is because it was easier to on-ramp new users then because the ratio of new users to old users was the, it was multiply. And everyone looks at the demand, everyone looks at the supply side of inflation, but they don't look at the demand side of on-ramping new users. And that is what supply and demand in a speculative instrument is about. We know what the supply increase is because it's mathematically hard-coded within social consensus that Bitcoin is now about, uh, I don't know, half, like it's like 0.79 or something. And then Hex is 3.69. But in Hex, it's delayed so far into the future because you only get paid at the end of your stake and the average stake is 5.8 years that it's, it may be more than 0.74%. I'd have to do the math on it. And then furthermore, the Bitcoin inflation has to get sold to pay for electricity and pollution and mining hardware, but the hex inflation doesn't have to get sold at all. It's very similar to just giving yourself more coins because there's no negative externalities. So we have a system in hex that has shown price performance of 10,000 X in under two years that against Bitcoin is up either 200, I think it's up 250 X, but it might be up 750 X. I'd have to check the chart. If you'd bought January 5th, 2020, it's at 100% perfect flawless operation. It was given for free to Bitcoin holders. It's the world's first attempt at time deposits on the blockchain, which is a larger market than what Bitcoin tried to address. There's more money in time deposit. And, and while we do something that Bitcoin can't do, which is monetizing the time value of money, we also do payments better with cheaper fees. We also do interoperability and on-chain exchange better, which is why Hex is the number one traded product on Uniswap, period, that's not Ethereum or a stable coin. And it's been that way every day for like months, years. You know, I'm the guy that made Uniswap popular. I carried Uniswap on my Richard, back. Richard, I did more to Richard, promote Richard, Uniswap Richard, than Hayden Adams Richard, did. Look, I, I'm not attacking you as a person. I'm simply talking about the project. Again, my question is very simple. I'm sorry, I cut out there for a second. So if you answer this, please tell me you did. Um, my question isn't to compare you to anything else. I'm viewing Hex in a vacuum. Is Hex, at the end of the day, reliant on new investors? And if we want to talk about price action, you're down 96%. As of if, if you care... If you care about the price of anything, every single thing is reliant on new investors. Yes, everything. Okay, look, if you care about your business, it's reliant on new customers. Everything. Okay. Your, fr your framing reality is though it's a, I lose a point because I'm describing reality. All, all speculative Wait, instru okay, instruments, Richard, all businesses I, I wanna, have this property, all of them. Exact aspect. So, you, so let's just to do that exact aspect. So you believe everything would be a Ponzi scheme and a potential Ponzi scheme then. Because as you said before... And no, you're misusing the word. That is not what a Ponzi scheme means. You're, you're describing bubbles, but then you're saying Ponzi. You have to use strict language look, here, look, okay? okay here, Ponzi look, uh, means uh, there's a middleman. Ponzi has a middleman that screws you and lies about what was going on. Bubbles don't have that, okay? People can overpay for Beanie Babies. They can overpay for Bitcoin. They can overpay for Hex. Bubbles are just people used to think it was worth more. Now they think it's worth less. And by the way, that particular human thing that the humans do, it's very hard to program that out of them. It's very hard. To, you, I don't think you actually can program humans to not engage in bubble behavior. It's, a, it's part of the human experience. People want it more because the price went, the, went up. So they want it more because the price went up. So they want it more because the price went up. They want to pay higher. And when it gets lower, they want to sell it because it's worth less. Because like, it's a reflexive system. It's, 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 it's self-amplifying. The number goes up because it went up and it goes down because it went down, which is why we fall out of the parabola. We go so deep and why when we go up, we do blow off tops. So like th this, I don't understand why Bitcoin with a proof of work change somehow like is hard to understand. It's just Bitcoin with proof of work change. We pay you to lock up instead of do SHA-256 mining. We use Ethereum miners instead of Bitcoin miners. That's it. That, that's it. It's the end of story. It's not hard. It's easy. And oh, it so works really good. Tony, I think dropped out again. Tony, are you there? Uh, so while waiting for Tony to join, I'm just going to mute you as well. For anyone waiting, uh, a lot of people are DMing me to, to start announcing the winners. So while everyone's listening to the debate, 
and we're trying to bring up Tony again. Tony, when you're here, just speak so I know you're, you're back on. We'll be announcing the next winner on Telegram. So maybe even more than one winner. We'll be announcing winners on Telegram. So make sure you go click on the pinned tweet and on top of the space and join Telegram to, to, uh, um, to, uh, to know if you won. I'm just trying to bring up Tony. KK, can you try to bring up Tony as well? Help me out. Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to do that in the background. Cool. So the first winner has just been announced, just for anyone listening. If anyone that just joined as well, I appreciate you all being here. We've got over 3,500 people in the space, which is the biggest space that we've had. The biggest we've had before was the peak at 2,600. So I think the audience is enjoying the debate. Um, and I really want to bring up Tony as well, because I think the point is further, uh, you know, further pressing on the question he asked. But while bringing up Tony, Simon, are you with us? Hey, guys. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Sorry, this went longer than I expected. I appreciate you being here. So, so we're going to continue the debate in a bit, uh, but I wanted to, to to take a quick break to go through what happened with Celsius and that declared bankruptcy yesterday, and what that means for the markets. I know you've you've had you know you, you've been pushing hard to try to get a bailout in place for Celsius. Um, just want to see the latest updates with that and um, bail in, where things bail are at the moment. <laughs> bail in, my apologies, my apologies. Yeah, no worries. <clears throat> so, so the mic, the mic is yours, man. All right. Okay. Yeah. Um, no. So, I mean, I did a, an update earlier on Ivan and Tech, full disclosure. Um, it, I think this relates to, look, I, I was listening in a little bit, doing some other things on the side. Um, I think the bit that our industry gets wrong across the board um, is risk management, the risk of these things being securities um, and just really managing things. So when, when, when I'm investing in this industry, um, what people do is they tend to say one philosophy um, and then the implications is that people hear that philosophy and put all their money in that thing. Um, when really the, you know, what, what, when I'm thinking about how to allocate money, I'm thinking of different scenarios and how I protect from being wrong. Um, and so, you know, we could sit here talking about, you know, hex all day versus Bitcoin I, I don't see that as a, I put my money in hex or I put my money in Bitcoin. Um, I see that as what what problem does Bitcoin solve, and how do I hedge against being wrong? Um, so you know, when when I think about uh, the way my particular way of investing is so that I never blow up. Um, does that mean that I don't have percentages in my portfolio that blow up? Um, no, because we're we're always get things wrong and things happen. Um, and so when, when I'm thinking about how to manage, um, you know, the, the uh, essentially, you know, how do you manage um, a portfolio? The way I think about it is whatever goes wrong, I'm still OK. And that's how I think about it. Um, so when I think about the dollar, I think about, um, a, a, you know, a debt based Ponzi scheme that requires central bank digital currencies as the last leg. Um, in order to take out a lot of the debt from the, the, the fact that money is created as banks and then they shift it to central banks. Um, in terms of effect of that, that's a shift, a, a slow shift away from free market debt-based money created by a private bank over to, um, depending on whether it's created as crony capitalism with the government um, or it's created by the central bank and depending on the organization um, of that, um, then it's a shift from, you know, uh, more, uh, you know, uh, uh, well, for, uh, um, it's, a, it's a different way of organizing an economy from capitalism to communism and the, the degrees in between. Um, but um, in order for the dollar system to continue, I will still bet on the Federal Reserve pushing that. Um, and that will be an eventuality. I also know that every fiat currency blows up and will expose. Um, and that's where gold does come in. Um, gold is a is a way of managing the transition. Um, fiat currency was just a token that sits on top of gold. And every hundred years, we have a transition back to hard money after wars and monetary renegotiations. Um, then Bitcoin is, for me, um, a way of having digital um, hard sound money. And then you think about, well, what eventualities do you need to protect from? So. Richard was talking about um, whether we need whether you need to protect from proof of work, um, and so then you look at well, what's the proof of stake chain? Well, you you have infinitely higher risk um, by having a chain that's transitioning from proof of work to proof of stake, 
and therefore you'd expect higher returns or um, higher risks. Um, and uh, you're hedging against an eventuality. And so how much do you want to allocate towards that type of um, eventuality um, and being wrong about a, a conviction you might have about Bitcoin? Um, then you think about, well, not your keys, not your coins. Well, people lose their keys. Um, and therefore, custody is a hedge against not your keys, not your coins. Uh, at the same time, um, you know, you, you want to protect yourself from those centralized institutions and the custodian. Um, and so what, what people tend to do is they say, look, here is my map of the world. And then they expose themselves to one eventuality. And that's exactly how you blow yourself up. Um, and, uh, and, you know, Celsius is an example of that. Um, Alex Mazinski fraudulently misrepresented what the product was um, and told them that you need to take, you should take your money out of a bank and debank yourself. And so innocent people that didn't know how to analyze the risk took all of their life savings out of the bank um, and put it into Celsius, not realizing that it wasn't a low risk saving account. It was actually um, a high risk hedge fund um, or even worse, a fractional reserve bank. Uh, depending on what happens. And as we got the bankruptcy today, we find out that there's a billion dollar hole. Um, and essentially everyone was investing in Alex Mijinsky's um, ability um, and his team's ability um, to try and unwind a bunch of shit. Um, and that is fraudulent, um, a big problem. And it's the reason why the Celsius had to go into chapter 11. Um, and so all, all I'm trying to say here is um, I, I think the big problem in our industry is people coming up with a map of the world um, and saying, put all your, uh, essentially people translate that as put all your money into this one eventuality. Um, and then they expose themselves. And that's why we have these arguments, people blowing up and, and all those things. Um, so if, if there's any one thing that comes out of this whole scenario is it's a game of risk management. There is many uncertain eventualities that exist in our world. Um, and Bitcoin um, is one of those eventualities that it protects you, gives the ability to own your own money, spend your own money and have a fixed supply. Now, when, if I'm thinking about something like Hex, and again, excuse me, I'm not too involved uh, in the project and I haven't studied it hard enough um, to know how to analyze it. Um, but the way that I would think about it is that it's a bet on, okay, so you've got Bitcoin proof of work, then you go higher down the risk curve, you've got Ethereum that's transitioning from proof of work to proof of stake, there's a risk involved in that. Then there's a smart contract that's built on top of that, there's a risk involved in that, and Richard's done a job of articulating you know, how um, it's, 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 a, it's been a flawless smart contract and it's had audits and all those types of things. Um, and then you start looking, you know, well, then you have exposure to um, not just the yield that it generates, but also the price of the underlying token. So are you investing for income or capital gains? And then if it's represented as a, a certificate of deposit, but your expenses are in one currency, um, then you're in a speculative environment. And what, what's happened here is if you look at something like Celsius. Celsius started, um, or it should have, or what I invested into before it completely changed, um, was an ability for someone that owns Bitcoin to pull out some dollars um, so that they don't have to sell their Bitcoin and it has tax implications depending on your jurisdiction, matched up in an over-collateralized environment. Um, and, uh, but then suddenly it becomes a high-risk security because they're now investing in multiple things. So you're now investing in fund management. Oh, and then it turns out that the hedge funds and the big people get under collateralized and the retail get over collateralized. Um, and it turns out that there's some funds missing. Um, and all of a sudden you uh, have a complete misrepresentation that causes people literally messaging because they're suicidal because they don't want to tell their partner um, that they've lost the, the, the life savings um, and their, their, their children's um, college accounts. You know, so th this is why, and you know, we talk about getting rid of securities laws. Securities laws are not about using just um, a, a test. A security law is, did people come into this to make an investment? And if so, securities laws exist around disclosures. Are those disclosures made? Do people know what they're investing in? Um, are they um, putting through suitability? Is this product suitable for that person? What percentage of it should they do? And this is, you know, 
financial planning 101. Um, and securities laws exist, not just because we said, oh, this is a security and we've used legal gymnastics in order to prove that it's not. Um, it's, it's to put these different products in categories. Is this a currency? Is it a commodity? Is it a security? From my perspective, you know, again, stable coins, right? What did we, what caused all this mess? Well, a central banker uh, came along and said, let's collateralize a stable coin based upon a hugely speculative security called Luna. Um, and uh, and uh, when it will we'll slap a decentralized ticket on top of it, um, and then everyone is misrepresented into not understanding the risk of it. Um, and then it turns out you can't pull the dollars out of a bank because when it depegs, the algorithm fails and the collateral shit and we get cascading liquidations um, because of these uh, different types of risks. Now, so for me, this whole thing about security, non-security, um, risk, uh, higher risk is just about us having a higher standard as an industry and disclosing what you're investing into. And then as individuals, we hold, have to hold ourselves accountable for understanding the different types of risks. And if somebody is just a hardcore crook and completely misrepresented, then saying to um, you know, that person that really didn't have a framework of analyzing the risks and saying, not your keys, not your coins, is not really telling the whole story of they thought that they were just investing into a low risk savings account because someone you know, completely fraudulently. Yeah, go for it. I mean, I've, I've always considered disclosure as a very low bar. So you make some trash, the trash sucks, and then you like slap on the website, hey, this trash sucks. So uh, if you get totally wrecked, you know, be cool with it. I think if this is like people that advertise for bad things, like Peter McCormick. I got a debate with Peter McCormick where I said he was a scumbag for trying to take people's keys out of their hands and promoting centralized lenders. And guess what? Some of those centralized lenders straight up rug pulled, and this was like a year and a half ago maybe, and then now everybody rug pulled and everyone was promoting all of these guys. And yeah, so, sure. so I, let me let me let me unpack it, Richard, because you 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 know do one point, we'll do one at a time. So how people will interpret that is, oh shit, I need to put all of my money into decentralization. Now, how many people rug pulled in these DeFi contracts? And how many people really have the ability to analyze the technical risks, the volatility risks, the yield risks, and the fact that there may just be, you know, all of the things that you say that make Hex better um, than the other things. Most people just don't have a framework in order to analyze these things. And so there is a place for putting um, some money with a custodian um, if there's um, a regulatory environment um, that allows, that, that allows um, some of the known risks in these models um, to be minimized and disclosed. And there is a place for DeFi. Um, and the worst you know, thing that happened with, with Celsius is you take all the good parts out of DeFi because, I mean, essentially, if someone takes a private key and they figure that part out and then they download MetaMask and they figure that part out, um, and they figure out how to, you know, um, buy some ETH and they figure out how to send that to a wallet where you have self-custody and they figure out how to um, execute a smart contract and lock it up um, and they figure out how to not lose the key. Um, that's a pretty sophisticated um, type of technical competence to get there. Um, and um, if you've got there, then great. DeFi is, um, you know, it's more transparent. You can see the collateral. But then you've got these misrepresentations of people saying it's decentralized um, that you're, you've always warned against, Richard. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and this is where I believe. And then someone comes along and I believe that there is a great degree of the community that have heard all of your presentations, all of your arguments, um, and essentially have put all of their money into Hex. Now, that may have worked out beautifully and produced a million percent returns. I don't know how I haven't put the time in um, to analyze that. Um, but saying that that is an alternative um, to Bitcoin is a completely different risk profile. Um, and people interpret these things. Um, and, and, uh, and when these things go wrong, that's when securities laws kick in. Because securities laws kick in when, oh, I made loads of money on the way up. I don't give a shit. But now, all of a sudden, I do care. And uh, I contact the regulator. And the regulator will then say, oh, you know, fuck dealing with all these people. Let's just allow rich people to do it. So, you know, and, and that's the end result of all these things. It's cycles 
Um, and I don't really know how to solve these things. Um, disclosure is one way of doing it. Suitability is another way of doing it. But these things just happen in cycles time and time again. And the only thing that we can do is become wiser after each cycle and prepare for different eventualities and don't put everything into one eventuality based upon you know, what someone is saying about how this is vastly superior to something else. They're just different outcomes. Did you did you invest? I mean, I think I heard that you were uh, you had some. Exp I know. So like Simon Dixon, he invests in uh, the crypto space. So on this call, he probably takes more counterparty risk than anyone else. Probably everyone combined, really. I mean, I think you've been invested in hundreds of crypto deals, like hundreds of crypto businesses, probably. Yeah, equity all, all centralized equity. Um, and and uh, yeah, I, I own shares in most of the major companies in crypto. Yeah, so, you know, he has a unique position in that he endures literally the most counterparty risk of anyone else on the call. I mean, any of these guys can just decide to embezzle, you know, from the company and just do bad yeah, things. But, like, but my, my equity is 5% of my private key um, value. Um, so, you know, I'm just managing different events. So for me, rather than messing around with all of these shit coins, I just invest in an exchange and an exchange has 3000 people that work there that have to analyze what everyone is investing in. And when the market crashes, they get fees. When the market goes up, they get fees. Um, and then you end up with a, a, a hugely valuable company. Now, can that um, end up being, you know, something like Celsius where it becomes fraudulent? Um, yes, it can. Um, and, but, but, you know, and this is, you, you don't find a pension fund or hedge fund or anyone in the world um, well, actually, hedge funds, definitely. But it's about preparing for different eventualities. So just because I say I invest in exchanges, people will then start interpreting that. And, you know, at Bank to the Future, we have to literally get people to take um, an online test so that they can prove they understand the product. And, um, you know, we, we have to do these things because these, these regulations exist and we take the responsibility very seriously that you shouldn't be investing more than 10% of your income in such um, in you know private equity. And you should be diversifying across 10 deals because it's highly likely that some of these will blow up. Um, and, and you know, that that's that's where I think everyone needs to get to in the end. Um, and it takes a long time for people to learn those lessons and a lot of mistakes along the way. And I trade, I see your, your hand up. You're, you're free to jump and I think so. You're free to jump in. Yeah, there, man, you're muted, and I think. Yeah, so okay. I think I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll take it off with a question with regards to the Celsius. I think, I think, every, I think every, everything you said is useful. Perfect. Go ahead, guys. So, Simon, so quick quick question. Um, so the, the, the first question that I had for the audience is the actual pin tweet with regards to the short-term cause of the uh, Celsius fail. And then the second question that I have, and I want to start off with the second question first, is how does the Chapter 11 filing uh, affect your Celsius recovery plan? And were you aware that the team was going to do a Chapter 11 filing uh, as you're part of the Celsius recovery plan? Uh, could you take it one question at a time? Because I can't remember three at a time. Um, let's, do the first yeah, one. Let, let, let's start off with the uh, Chapter 11, how it's going to affect uh, depositors. Okay. Um, so I, when I realized um, and I contacted Alex Mijinsky um, and gave them the plan that we implemented for Bitfinex that recovered them from the 119,000 Bitcoins that were hacked um, from the exchange, um, I realized that uh, he then put me over to Citibank, then we gave it to Citibank, and I know that Citibank have a executive board that you need to get things signed off on, so they wouldn't have moved fast enough, and that would create um, a big uh, a problem. Um, and then um, I realized that this wasn't going to get executed um, because there was actually fraudulent activity happening here, and Alex Mazinski was covering his ass. Um, and uh, when he was started covering his ass, I went public, and said, we need to get access to the financials. Um, once you've got access to the financials, we can then put together a recovery plan. And I realized that those financials were not going to come until um, Alex Mazinski was re removed from the board via um, just having a consulting role by a committee moving over to Chapter 11. Um, and so uh, that was an effort in order to make that happen. 
uh, because by default, the company was actually split up into three. And then they were trying to sell off the two units in order to hide what was happening in the main unit. Um, and that, that type of activity um, was what I was trying to um, support people in understanding the transparency can only come out in chapter 11. So what does chapter 11 mean? Chapter 11 just means that it's not chapter seven, which is the eventuality you need to avoid where they just liquidate everything, create cascading liquidations, um, you know, uh, shit for the whole market again, um, Lehman Brothers of crypto moment, um, and uh, instead move to chapter 11 where a real can be um, completed. Um, and so at the moment we're submitting plans in order to um, support uh, all of those victims um, becoming equity holders in a reorg um, of a Bitcoin investment bank that can really get back to the roots of, um, you know, what, what, what can be achieved here at the sovereign level um, and various other things that are happening. Um, uh, you know, we, uh, the Bitcoin M&A, some of the things that we've been involved with. And, it, and really the lessons are as follows. There's leadership. Um, Alex Mazinski was completely inappropriate um, to run a financial services company because he didn't take his responsibilities serious enough um, in, in making sure that, that he's representing the product in the correct way and is willing to do things that are out of line of ethics, like dump sell tokens while telling people to buy. Um, the second one is uh, you need to have the regulations right because these turned out to be securities um, or it was an unlicensed bank. So those need to be sorted as well. Um, and uh, the collateral at the end of the day, um, and this is where you know, it becomes important, um, as you move down the risk curve of these different products, it's incredibly hard to um, do, you know, get the risk you can take. You, a stable coin where you can pull out the dollars, if you can know that the dollars can be pulled out, um, then that's a completely risk, different risk profile to um, a stable coin based upon collateralized shit coins. Um, and then Bitcoin's a different risk profile. And then you just go further and further down and nobody, you know, can manage those risks. Long-term capital market was the smartest people in the room with the, the highest levels of PhDs that almost took down the precursor to the FDIC system, that almost took down uh, most of the, the banking system um, that required and created the, the, the model of government bailouts, um, basically because no one can manage those risks. So you need to get back to pristine collateral. And what is pristine collateral? Unfortunately, a hugely volatile asset that goes further down the risk curve um, cannot be compared to collateralizing based upon Bitcoin just because, you know, there may be some technically superior type of design, but a completely different risk profile. Um, and, and, you know, th these, these are complicated subjects that we're, we, we as a, an industry are trying to allow people to do it in a decentralized way um, and also do it in a centralized way with with people. And at the end of the day, there's shit regulations and there's good regulations and, and good regulations are designed to prevent um, fraudsters from misrepresenting things. Shit regulations are the ones that make you put all your data um, on a on a on a you know on these uh, servers so that they can get hacked and be used um, for identity theft and um, all sorts of things for you. Um, but you know when you have these centralized institutions, and I completely buy into the decentralized model, um, you know, but uh, it, it's not gonna it's not all or one. It's it's a combination of of different eventualities and different risks. Okay, crypt Sweet. crypto was Sweet. invented to yeah. solve this, and it does. Crypto is literally invented to solve this, crypto and it literally does. does. You just had to use it. It does, and that's why the vast majority of my stack is Bitcoin on a on a private key, where I own my own money, spend my own money, and um, and 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 I'm happy with uh, you know the the risk profile of that, and that's also why a percentage of that I'm willing to put at risk in centralized, and a percentage of that I'm willing to put at risk in decentralized, and a percentage of that I'm willing to expect higher returns or lower returns based upon whether it successfully transitions from proof of state to proof of work and then there's a use case but it just goes infinitely further down the risk curve um when, when and then therefore a, a smaller allocation uh, should be dedicated to to these solving these problems in your portfolio i was saying like it's on chain you don't have to wonder whether a guy's under collateralized or not when you can literally just look at his balances like we can right. we can kind of see their balances now right like there's some website that shows celsius is actual like known kind of public wallet addresses so we kind of can see how much they have left yeah the DeFi part um 
people could see. But what you don't know is the shenanigans that happen. So you could say, okay, DeFi, and then that represents to people that everything's on chain. I have a sneaky suspicion, and I know the market manipulation behaviors that people engage in, because I used to work in market making at the investment bank, and it's even worse at many of these exchanges, um, that there is side contracts that sit on top of DeFi where centralized entities are lending things to each other or having side agreements to put things on chain in order to manipulate people to take certain behaviors. So you still can't say by putting everything on chain, you're, you're removing a lot of those shenanigans. You're just, you're just having one risk removed and replacing it with another risk. And then you've got the smart contract hacking. And then you've got the underlying chain. And then you've got the transitions that happen there and the fault. I want to hear about the shady thing. I want to hear details about that. Because, like, that sounds juicy, man. Like, because I understand. So, like, okay, I'm going to expand on what he just said. So there's this thing called, like, proof of keys, right? And it's kind of like, okay, you're going to see if the exchange is solvent. But in reality, they could have, like, borrowed that money or encumbered that money and already, like, encapsulated it and put it at huge risk. And so even though it shows on their balance sheet, it's not really on their balance sheet. And so I think he's describing something similar to that, but way more juicy and spicy. I'd love to hear about it. If, if you've got any, like, details, you don't have to drop, like, real names or anything. Uh, you know, it's just what, what I said, that you can have on, on top of the, the, the danger in, in DeFi and on-chain transactions is that people rely on them without knowing that a legal agreement can sit on top in the offline world. You know, that's kind of why why it's very hard to have um, gold on a blockchain because you don't really know whether that gold is owned and um, where, you know, those types of things. And the same thing happens on chain. And so, you know, um, the, the, the shenanigans that happen in our markets, that happen in the traditional markets, you know, they're never going to go away. Um, but it, it doesn't solve, you know, it, it solves one problem um, and, and, and opens up another attack vector. Um, okay. and Can I ask why, you how many more, how much more cascade risk is there, do you think? Like how many, how many other like lenders haven't gone under yet? Or like, I'm trying to guess because I use these to yeah. modify my bottom call, right? Yeah. Um, so you're right. The bottom call would be based upon the centralized entities counterparty risks at the moment. Um, my belief is that a successful chapter 11 um, reorg um, would prevent um, liquidations if it moves into chapter, if it moves into chapter seven or liquidations, um, then I believe that there's a lot more counterparties that would fall out and be shaken out in that in that situation. Um, and so we are literally, as a decentralized industry, um, dependent upon this, uh, this uh, you know, this connection between the centralized and decentralized. And I don't think there's any way of getting around that. You know, it's kind of like, look what's happening at the sovereign level right now. So, you know, um, Bekele says, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy some Bitcoin. Um, and we're going to create a securities market based upon um, Bitcoin. Um, and we're going to have Bitcoin back bonds. Um, and then Sam from FTX comes along and said, no, do it all on a shit coin and then creates Aurora coin all over again. And we have those. We know that that always ends badly. And then he goes to Africa and says, let's take the people that have been most shafted by the British colonial system that stole all their God, their gold um, and their silver by literally um, creating um, agribeads and inflating away their currency and selling them off as slaves. Um, and let's do that again with shit coins. Um, and then you've got other countries that are saying, let's do it at the central bank digital currency level. You know, you've got these three intertwined things. And the key thing to all of this is the fact that we now have choice. And that's what I think the, the most important part of this is. So when people are saying, you know, um, we, when we're debating here, um, it's all about if we can give people an exit from the traditional financial system, an exit from DeFi, an exit from um, from centralized custodians, um, then you just need to manage those choices. You know, I still use fiat currency a lot because if I started, I know so many people um, that they, they were involved in Bitcoin from the early days. They didn't get wealthy because they had to spend it as they go. Um, and so you still need fiat currency in order to manage um, just the, the normal um, the normal, you know, risk management of how do you how do you manage your life? Now, uh, you know, and that's essentially, you know, what what I'm trying to say here. Wait, Simon, just a quick question on the Celsius part. Yeah, yeah. So let's get it, back to the Celsius. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's clearly that they're acting deliberately and they falsified. So their claims. I don't. Uh, 
Oh, um, I believe the, the answer to that is literally if the community puts together um, the bail-in solution that we're proposing to Chapter 11 right now, um, and everybody um, becomes equity holders in the proposal that we're going to be putting through, um, and if someone else comes up with a better proposal, that um, then uh, Chapter 11 will go through and no cascades. Um, if it turns out that these solutions um, don't get through Chapter 11, um, then I think you'll move into liquidation of assets in cascades. So really the courts are going to decide whether that what the, pr the price of the industry is. Simon, mean, you think that uh, Alex went into this entire thing with these intentions? Um, I think that, look, I, I, I just want to focus on solutions right now, but I will give you some. No, 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 uh, and yeah. I'm all about that too. It's just um, that, the, the, the regulators went in. Yeah, with with the regulators and the lawyers will, will, will determine that. Uh, that's not my job. But I believe that um, applying the same rules of how you grow a tech startup to financial services um, it can often lead to completely inappropriate leadership. Um, and if people don't take the responsibility seriously, you know, it's kind of right. Dogecoin, a classic example. So it's created as a joke. Um, the, 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 the economics are horrific. And then, uh, uh, you know, the leader of uh, Tesla, Elon, just thinks it's a good idea to just start talking about it. And then people make financial decisions based upon that. There's a certain level of responsibility that we need to understand. And sometimes shit gets out of control. So my personal belief is that um, Alex had the type of personality where you're involved in the startup world. And in the startup world, you essentially have to overfabricate the truth in order to get VCs to invest. Um, but in the financial services world, you should underfabricate the truth um, just so that people are over disclosed. Um, and uh, and if you take um, somebody that comes from the other mindset, um, and doesn't respect the, the types of compliance requirements that are going to come from running a regulated institution, um, you're going to end up with this shit. And so uh, I, think, I think there's a certain point at you, which you say, I am in over my head um, and, uh, and these mistakes have been made and I need to fess up um, and tell the world that these mistakes have been made. Um, I think that uh, if, if the, the bank run didn't happen, and this was allowed to get bigger and bigger and bigger, then it would have just got a lot and lot, lot uh, uh, you know, worse and, and more financial loss. Um, Simon, so, Simon. Like, yeah. what do you think about the, the 70,000 Finex hacked coins? Are they going to get uh, given back to Finex or dumped by the, the feds? And what do you think about the uh, Gox coins? Um, 142,000. Well, we, I guess we could just look at the model of what, what has happened and those... So the Finex ones are going to be given to um, Leo token holders and those that invested in the ba the bail-in. Um, but you think you they, think the government's going to give them to Finex? Because I thought uh, I thought the motions were they were trying to sell them. I don't know. Now this one this one's a really interesting one, right? Because uh, on one hand, there's um, DOJ uh, trying to um, settle, and on the other hand, there's DOJ that's got a bunch of Bitfinex assets now. Um, do I have faith in governments that they won't manipulate that scenario into their benefit? Um, I've seen some really mafia style of behaviors from um, governments and regulators. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, but I do believe that the, the, it's more likely that the DOJ is going to be giving those back and they will go to the token holders. Um, but I don't have much faith in um, governments doing the right thing as well. What about Mount Gox coins? 142,000 Mount Gox BTC. So you've got force hodl for eight years. Um, I think it, it really depends how many of those people became wealthy uh, in that time um, versus the ones that just uh, gambled it too much and, and uh, didn't end up in a much bigger financial position. Um, I, I got a funny anecdote. I got a funny anecdote for that. So yeah. Mount Gox leaked their whole list. So uh, if you wanted to, you could just actually cold call the list. And uh, I can't tell you how I might know this, but everyone's wrecked. So like everyone on that Gox list is broke as fuck. Yeah. Like almost everybody. Uh, and we saw that in um, a recent exchange that blew up based upon um, someone we thought was very wealthy that um, apparently has been liquidated. So, Bro, there's uh, no way. There's no way Roger's fucking wrecked. There's no. There's, I know. It's, it's crazy, that right? real. 
He's got fucking XRP founder status. He's got fucking BC. Well, okay, wrecked on BCH for sure. I don't know. Like, really, Roger wrecked? I can't fucking. That would be no, mind blowing. Can you guys? Can you guys? Can you expand this? Can you expand this for the audience for anyone that doesn't know? <laughs> uh, Jerry Springer. I like Roger. He's like pro freedom and shit. So I'm not gonna like savage him based on fucking uh, like hearsay. But I could tell you what the hearsay is, I guess. So like. Roger is like arguing on Twitter with uh, Coin Floor or Coin somebody. Queen I don't know. Flex, who. Mark Lamb from Coin Flex. Okay, and he, and they're like uh, arguing over like forty or sixty million or something, saying each one of them owes the other one, and uh, well, one of them's lying, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah, I find it very hard to believe um, the the yeah. That, that Roger could be wrecked. Um, I, I find that hard to believe. Because I, I don't think he's like no, a take margin kind of a guy. We're talking, about, we're talking about Roger. Why would Roger, you? Oh my God. You're not talking about Roger V, are you? Yes, yes, we are, yeah. Holy shit. Roger Ver, Bitcoin Jesus. Yeah, but. Yeah, for anyone. Man, fucking, you yeah, know. So you're chopping it. You're chopping up um, uh, uh, Richard, but if anyone doesn't know Roger V, a lot of the, the people that joined in the last couple of years, been in this space for a long time. Uh, the, the founder of, of uh, what was Bitcoin's fork called? What was his? Uh, uh, Richard, the fuck? chopping it in and out. Yeah, Richard, you're, you're chalky. Um, basically invested yeah. in many of the early Bitcoin startups. So we co-invested in blockchain.com, Kraken, um, Ripple Labs, the company, 